Welcome. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board on Monday, March 20th, 2023, the first day of astronomical spring. I am Select Board Chair Leonard Diggins, and I will now confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan. Affirmative. John Hurd. It doesn't feel like spring. <laughs> yes. It was 50 something today. <laughs> so, so, uh, Eric Helmuth. Yes, and no complaints about the weather. <laughs> Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Sandy Pooler. Here. Doug Heim. Here. Ashley Meyer. Here. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, signed into law on July 17th, 2022, which further extends certain COVID-19 measures regarding remote participation until March 31st, 2023. Before we begin, please note the following. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom. It is being recorded and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Second, persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Third, all participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. So, the next item is an update, discussion, and possible vote on the town manager search process. I turn to Mr. Heim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll try to be brief. As the board and the public may recall, the screening committee for the town manager search forwarded four candidates for the final round of interviews, which are public. Uh, however, after forwarding those candidates, but before the board had an opportunity to conduct interviews, three candidates withdrew from the process, leaving us with only one candidate who wished to continue in the process who was basically publicly identifiable. That candidate is Deputy Town Manager Jim Feeney. Um, at, this point, at that point in time, we wanted to make sure that there were no concerns regarding the open meeting law because the preliminary screening committee is supposed to, by law, forward more than one finalist candidate to the next stage. Based on a review of the law, the work of the preliminary screening committee, which was fantastic, and discussions with the Division of Open Government, who were very generous with their time, I feel confident that the board can proceed with their finalist. Again, in brief, what the open meeting law required was for the preliminary screening committee to forward more than one uh, candidate to the next round, and they did. They recommended four. Um, with respect to the withdrawals, my understanding is there are many reasons why that might be the case, ranging from um, nerves about whether or not they would get the job, uh, since most of the candidates are uh, going to be executives in other municipalities, uh, to understanding the strength of uh, some internal candidates in some situation to personal circumstances. We don't get to know why. Um, but in any event, at this point in time, the board can proceed to schedule an interview with the uh, finalists that wish to remain in the process and can be publicly identified. And um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But um, the long and short of it is, if you want to make an appointment after an interview of uh, Mr. Feeney, you may. If you decide that that's not the right candidate for you, um, at that point, this particular search process would be over and you'd have to relaunch a search process and may decide a different way to go about finding additional candidates if you felt that was what you needed to do after an interview of your candidate. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions? Oh, okay. So i turn our colleagues. Mrs. Mahon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, having been through this the most, I can say that. <laughs> you try not to um, do that. Um, I think what we should do is uh, we've gone through the process, had the screening committee, had them do everything under the, the open meeting law. That's an extra step that this board takes. Um, legally, under the law, we could, as long as three or more of us agreed on a name, you know, uh, Jane White or something. Um, we could have just done that, but we, we uh, have always endeavored and taken the extra step of the screening committee. So what I'd like to do now is um, hear from my colleagues of 
setting um, an interview, what, what we've done in the past, it's been done uh, two different ways. Sometimes it was a separate night. We had the finalist interviews. Then um, asked the, the finalists to leave. And then we've had our deliberations. And then in the framework of calling a public session open meeting and then voted for the town manager candidate that night. Um, with the exception of Mr. Sullivan, um, it usually was something that was fairly, uh, not, a, not a lot of time. With Mr. Sullivan, we were at 2, 2, and 1 for about 40 minutes, and we had a discussion and went from there. So I guess what I would pose to my colleagues, and also recognizing, um, as we know, uh, Mr. DeCourcy uh, had a previous engagement for tonight, we could either um, entertain uh, perhaps doing the interview March 27th at uh, 5.30 or 6, or uh, do it the following Monday if we want to stay on a Monday, or if we want to have a separate night, um, pick a Wednesday, um, which at the earliest it would have, I would say just for everybody's sake and calendars, it would have to be next week, also with the open meeting law. So I guess I'm wondering how you all feel about whether to do it and or another day, another, but I'm kind of looking at, do we do it a Monday, March 27th, which like 536, and then do enough time. Uh, I don't anticipate a long deliberation because I don't see a 221 board with um, the one finalist. And then in the frame of the open meeting, um, if we're at that point in us, do we want to do it on a Wednesday and which Wednesday or something else? Um, I'd say I'm happy moving forward with one candidate. I think we asked for a screening committee to send us three to five candidates. They sent us four. Um, so I don't want to go back and say, all right, who's your next three who at that time might also withdraw for the same reasons. So I think we'll go round and round. So I think we should set up a meeting with Jim and... I'm not, I mean, I think we can do it on a regularly scheduled meeting. I, I don't think we have <coughs> another night in addition to the eight straight Mondays that we've been here. Um, so, you know, I think that would be my preference would be, sorry, I thought that was on silent, would be to do it on the same night as a meeting. Um, but like you said, I, I don't, you know, hopefully we can kind of push off some some non-critical stuff that we have and kind of centralize that on that night and not flood the agenda up and just focus on that since that's important. I don't anticipate that this is going to be a long protruded discussion like some past searches just because past have had multiple candidates to talk about. But my preference would be to do it on the same night as a meeting that we have scheduled. Thank you. I uh, thank you, Attorney Heim, for uh, for your legwork and due, due diligence. That's really important. This is an extremely, probably the most important decision this board makes for the town. And um, I'm really pleased to hear that we we have a finalist who was a top pick, you know, with 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 a class of four, and went through a robust, rigorous screening committee screening process with the committee. Um, and that gives me confidence that Mr. Feeney is well worth talking to. And I think, you know, the task of the board is to um, conduct a, a rigorous interview and then decide at that point, you know, if, we, if we're moving forward there or taking another and taking another route. Um, so that's, uh, and I'm, I'm very comfortable doing so. Uh, with respect to the timing, I guess a couple of thoughts. I think... Um, I, I'm aware that uh, Mr. DeCourcy had a conflict tonight, and so, you know, I am not sure how to resolve this, but, you know, I'd feel better with his participation in, in any kind of vote as to how to proceed. Um, although, you know, I, I leave that to some of my colleagues, and particularly the chair, um, for your view on that. I don't, I don't have a strong feeling about it, but it's just something I'm aware of. And, um, and then also, I think, 
it would be good for the board to, you know, I am agreeing with the regular scheduled meeting, by the way, to take, to take some time to, uh, to not, uh, not, we don't need to uh, make this a long process, but we don't need to rush either. And I think setting up an interview uh, format that is really effective and really help us answer that, that big question, is this the direction we want to go, I think would be worth taking a little bit of time to do that. I don't know how many, not weeks, but you know, <laughs> days at least. Um, so, um, and I, I, having received the news tonight, um, I don't know what the options are because I've never done one of these, unlike Mrs. Mahan, who's, who's the, the veteran <laughs> on this. So, um, so I'm happy to learn. I look forward to that. I can talk to some folks offline. I think we can access our consultant with, you know, for advice on that. Um, and then finally, in consideration of the candidate, too, I think, you know, allowing some, some time um, to prepare and, and, be in, and have awareness of what we have in mind would, would be good. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a kind of a jumble of things. I think what that says to me probably is we should do something next Monday, whether that's a formal vote to proceed or whether that's, um, you know, discussing how we want to do an interview, possibly doing the interview. I'm not quite sure how we incorporate Mr. DeCourcy's view of that. Um, but that's kind of where I'm thinking. Well, thank you. You know, so Mr. Corsi has been my plus one um, in this process because, I mean, uh, uh, and so I did have a conversation with him, uh, mm -hmm. and, and so he is fine um, with us going ahead with the interview on, on Monday. And, and I also discussed with him the possibility of setting aside another day, Tuesday or Wednesday, um, as a fallback I mean, so that we could do the interview. And if we feel that we need more time, I mean, then we would have that. He, they already set aside me, so it would just be, you know, we block it out, have a item be for the town manager uh, decision, you know, and, or discussion, decision, uh, possible vote. And, and if we don't need it, we don't need it, but if we need it, you know, then it's there because of open meeting law. We will have to, if, even if it's on Wednesday, we will have to, like, have that put out before I mean, our Monday meeting, you know, mm -hmm. so. So right. there's that, you know, and I will, of course, talk to our consultant uh, about the format I mean, of the um, interview. My sense is that I mean, the candidates are ready to go. <laughs> so, so, um, and, and so uh, I guess the question would be, I mean, do you want I mean, some kind of communication about the format for the meeting, you know? And I would say, I mean, I could put out something um, to everyone one way, you know, and that would give you at least information about what to expect, you know, and your role in it, you know. Um, so, so it's really a matter of whether that's sufficient. Ms. Mahan. And what's been done in the past, which does not have to happen all the time, <laughs> is um, our human resources director, Karen Malloy, has um, provided in previous town manager searches the board with if not exact, sort of comparable questions um, of town manager candidates. Uh, and one of the uh, bits of guidance she gave us, which we won't have to do in this process, was she really stressed, and um, I think also town council, if we had more than one candidate, it was always stressed, try to really ask, we're humans, so you can't ask the same question the exact same way, but try to stay in that format. So um, I would also ask the chair if you could just inquire of Ms. Malloy, um, our human resources uh, director, um, if she could provide, if, if my colleagues are in agreement with what she's done in the past. And that does not mean we're all, it, we are all individuals. It does not mean we are bound to those. Or we may read a question and say, you know what, that's not my question, but it, it triggered this. So uh, that's the only thing sure. I would add. Sure. And I, I was assuming that she would be brought into the process because you know, all along, uh, uh, Bernie and I have been working with Karen um, very closely. So, so um, does that sound okay? I mean, so now it's just a matter of what time we do it you know, on, on Monday. So I, you know, I've been, I've been kind of anticipating, you know, that it would happen, you know, uh, this meeting or, or, or next meeting, and, and, and chances are it wasn't going to happen this meeting because. Uh, Steve is going to be away, you know, so I'm not anticipating much on the agenda, you know, um, uh, next Monday, probably the review of the articles that we do today, uh, um, you know, some ba uh, art banners, you know, and I guess a few things may pop up, but we don't have a lot of articles to go through, so I mean, we can start earlier, you know, uh, uh, as early, as much early as people want, or we can start at the same time. I mean, I'll go off what the board wants, 
I actually was going to ask if we really still needed our meeting on Monday, next Monday, if we're done with warrant article hearings, if there's anything pressing. I mean, I think this, the, I mean, we, set, we have four months before the new town manager kicks in, but I mean, if we are going to have the meeting and do the, the interviews, I think we can start at a normal time. That's, that's my, yeah. my, yeah. my preference. Yeah. You're fine, you're fine, Sergeant? For Monday. For next Monday? Yeah. Yeah, 17, okay. All right. Okay. Oh, so I'm fine with that. I mean, um, so yes. I think one of the things is, I mean, I, I did think about this briefly too, like that, you know, there's a, a we're very fortunate to have Mr. Pulu's services. Um, and, and that's been an amazing um, bit of security and continuity um, and management. Um, and I thought, well, you know, could we even wait until, um, you know, for a couple of three weeks, but we are, we may have, we'll have some last minute things to do before town meeting. There might be a couple of late warrant articles we have to hear. Um, and then our votes and comments, and then we're into town meeting season. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah, I think that's. And I say that just for the public, so that they understand that this is not. This isn't so much a rush. It's just good, deliberate speed. Yeah, yeah. Because um, time is entropy. Time is entropy. It is tighter. Yeah, <laughs> tighter than it works. It's that's right. Is for any any plan. I mean, time just generally is not friendly to any plan. You know, anything can come up. You know, so unless there's some compelling reason, wait. I'm generally like, uh, so. All righty. So then the question is, do we need a vote? On this, are we okay? All right, yeah, okay. All right, so moving on consent agenda minutes of meeting February 27, 2023, March and March 6, 2023. Mr. Helmet, I move approval with an amendment um, to the minutes of February 27th. Just a correction that on the Alewife Brook um, warrant article, I actually I needed to recuse myself, and that's not reflected in the minutes. So, just that was a correction. I think uh, Attorney Hyman is going to make in the select board all report. So, I just asked that the uh, official correction be made in the select board business uh, minutes as well. Second. All right. So, on a motion by Mr. Helmuth with the corrections specified, and a second by Ms. Mahan. Mr. Hahn. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Nan, Ms. Boat. Great. So, on item number four, licenses and permits for approval, wine and malt license and common victual art license, Tai Moon, 315 Broadway. Hi. Hi, thank you for having me. And your name? Um, Thank you for being with us. You know, so you want to tell us um, about your establishment? I, I realize that you, know, you used to be on Mass Ave, and you know, now you're moving yeah. to. And so I'm glad you were able to stay in town. I'm sorry about me and the fire that led to the situation. So um, thanks for staying. Just tell us a little bit. Yeah. So the, um, about the liquor license or the the moving. To the other location. I'm about to move to the location, you know, okay. and maybe what's going to be different, you know, just just a little introduction. Sure, yeah. sure. So the um, Thai Moon actually um, uh, got caught and fired um, around April 29, 2021, I believe. It's been a long time. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it's it's almost two years yeah. at this point, <laughs> and um, we we still going through the. Um, insurance process um, with the payout it hasn't been settled yet so at this point um, we will we couldn't um, reach an agreement with the landlord at the old location so we moved to the new location um, Kylie and Ab, um, Ali Carter yeah. before she moved on she actually um, gave me I was really close to close down business um, because um, the, the disagreement um, in the terms and the lease and Ellie said, well, look at the location. Um, Toro just closed down um, yesterday. So I went down and checked out the space with my husband. And eventually, the town actually kind enough to um, give me some grants to put together um, the ventilation system. And a couple people, like customers, been been sending us email or notes. And thank you, notes. Or sometimes put the sign on the window, you know, to let us know that please come back to the business. So that's, that actually contributed to the decision to come back again. 
Well, that's very nice to hear. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm glad we actually have a few words because yeah. you know, I wasn't aware of the Ali Carter connection, but Ali's yeah, one of the first. Yeah, Ali is playing yeah. a big part on this. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say more because I'll probably say what my colleagues are going to say, so I'm going to turn to them and let the Mr. Mr. Hurd. Hello. Hi. Happy to move approval. Glad <laughs> to see that you guys are uh, opening back up. I know a lot of people are, are looking forward to this day when you open back up. It was certainly a tough loss for you guys and for the town when, when you had the fire. Um, I know the Cusanos, both as business owners and as hockey and baseball yeah. parents in town. Dante family. and Luca yeah. here, they're <laughs> both excellent athletes. Um, so I'm happy to move approval. Look forward to coming in once you're open again and glad to see you guys opening back up. Thank you. Thank you. I very happily second that. Um, I'm just thrilled that this worked out, <laughs> that you're able to stay as a uh, business member of the community, and that your family's here. Um, and I remember when the fire happened, uh, I, I don't know that I've seen such a, an uprising of public support and, and loss that your wonderful food <laughs> was, was not available. But um, so it's just, it's just a win all around. And um, I look forward to uh, enjoying it some more when you're back. It was amazing to, to see. I mean, I was, um, it was so heartfelt message and email and those. I mean, I, it's been almost two years and people still remember us, you know? Yeah, that, absolutely. That was, a nice town to be in. Um, we are so thankful for the support. That means you're doing something right. <laughs> Thank you. Great to see a success story. I know how <laughs> difficult it is in the restaurant business. <clears throat> My family's um, also in the same business and it's very difficult and one of the most difficult, well I, I would say two of the most difficult is first uh, creating a cuisine consistently that everybody likes. Um, and then also, um, I, I want to say it's not only the great food that you have. The second part is the environment and the people starting with the owner on down, um, how they make the customer feel, not just coming in to do a purchase, but a part of the community. I know a lot of people were, you know, very sad to have lost not only your cuisine, but also your business, you at the helm. Um, so that's really a great testament to you. and. And, and thank you for working with the town planning department. Um, it, it, you certainly, I don't want to use any cliche things, but you definitely didn't just, you know, say, well, that's it, I got to start over from scratch somewhere else. Um, sometimes it's even more difficult to stay in the community and, and try to replicate that. But um, thank you to your husband and your children for putting up with all of that, of things that had to be done, and dealing with the town. But sometimes it's a good thing, so. It's um, a nice town. We, we live in Arlington, so we, we would not want to be anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can't run away. <laughs> yeah. Everywhere we go, hockey ring and things, yeah. people ask for it. So it's, it's definitely um, something that we want to contribute as a family to the town as well. And everything in here is in order, and then the liquor license, I know you're well versed with it. Usually. There's some questions from the board that really probes a little bit more, but you, you're already familiar with that and, and, and what this board is, expects of you, and you've had a perfect record so far. So I look forward to your opening and wish you more continued great success. And thank you to you, your children, and your, and your husband for um, choosing us and staying with us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. And as always, I mean, the great part about going last is that my colleagues have said it all, they said it better than I. Would, so I'm just going to let that go. I'm not going to add anything more except to say that your son was like smiling so huge when John was talking about a, being a good hockey player. So, so it's great to see you know the the kind of other connection here. You know, so uh, a motion for approval by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Hyman. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Dickens. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to the opening. Moving on, traffic rules and order. Number five, discussion and approval. Fiscal year 2024 water sewer rates. Mr. Poehler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as is our usual practice, we come before the board tonight uh, annually to uh, request an adjustment to our water and sewer rates. Um, this year, uh, as opposed to the most recent uh, past three years, the rate increase is much smaller. Uh, water rates will go up by 3.66% and sewer rates will go up by 3.4%. Uh, 
um, so we're an average overall of 3.6%. Um, that is mostly because, uh, one, we have finished the debt uh, transfer where the general fund tax dollars were helps, helping to subsidize water and sewer rates. Uh, we phased that out over three years and going into FY24, we'll no longer be doing that. Uh, the second is that our usage compared to other communities in the MWRA has been relatively less, and so the overall increase is below the MWRA average. Um, and uh, this will uh, allow us to go forward in the next year, uh, have a balanced budget, and have sufficient funds to operate the Water and Sewer Department. So I would respectfully ask the Board's approval of these rates. Mr. Hearn. Happy to move approval of the rates as presented and just say it's nice this year. We got burned a little bit last year because not everyone understood the debt shift and even when you tried to explain it, some of us didn't really understand the debt shift. So it's nice to see reasonable rate increases this year. Second. All right. Let's do the squibble thing when I'm in person here. Uh, uh, okay. No. One quick question. Yes. Just to take advantage of the person we have captured, I mean sitting here in the audience, <laughs> if I could do the chair and the town manager, um, it's sort of germane to this. Um, I'm just wondering, just because where it's come up with the water rates when they do change, where are we with the meter replacement program? Uh -huh. And also, people have also asked me that, I've only heard of one circumstance, which I'll follow up offline, of a really like five figure bill, new water meter goes in and everything seems to go back to normal. But I'm just curious, and I understand that the water replacement program is separate from this, but since you're here and it's sure. on here. Sure, thanks. Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Thanks for your time. I, uh, the water meter project is a little bit behind uh, schedule, mostly due to procurement of materials. We're having a difficult time with the suppliers getting the needed water meters and the reading devices that we're installing on the outside of the home. We do, we have uh, between town forces and more recently with contracted help, we've probably installed about 90% of the town's water meters have been replaced. So we just have a, a small amount left comparatively. Uh, but we, again, we're having difficulty with the supplies. We were hoped to be done uh, by August, but um, with current projections, that might be closer to the fall to be complete. Uh, and, and to answer your second question, we are finding often when uh, in the past when we send bills out, if a water meter isn't reporting correctly or if it stopped for some reason, uh, we would put a note on a, a water bill that the read is estimated or, or, the, or if you have zero consumption, please call us and we'll send someone out to the residence to, to fight, figure out what's going on. Uh, we don't always get that phone call. And so with this process where we're heading into people's homes and replacing meters, we're finally getting an actual read of water used in a home. Um, and so it results in a catch-up bill where our records show you may have used 10 cubic feet, and, but in actuality used 100 cubic feet. And so we, we create a, a makeup bill to, to, to fill the gap. Um, what we will also do, though, because that happens over a longer period of time than one just one billing period, we can make an adjustment where we break up that usage over the period that it occurred, and we'll make an adjustment based on past rates. So we'll charge some of the usage to an older rate, some to the middle rate and the last rate. So we'll try to break up that usage over the period of time where we believe the meter was not working and, um, and spread the cost out in that manner. So that'll, that sometimes bring that, that oh. large bill down. Uh, but we, it, is, it is a result of um, finally seeing what actual usage is in some of these homes now that we're getting in and replacing the old meters. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Otterbacher. Thank sure. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford, on the theme of why we have you. Yeah. Um, could you remind me uh, how many miles of water lines we have? Because I know it's an astonishing number, and, and what our current situation is about the state of them and the, and the uh, replacement repair schedule. Sure. We have approximately 130 miles of water line, and our current um, 
maintenance funding, capital funding for that. We replaced about a mile a year, which uh, I, I, we need to ramp that up a bit. Uh, older water pipe is okay if it's built properly and it's in the right soil condition and whatnot, but uh, we're finding some of our more um, uh, maintenance prone or problematic pipe has been historically built in very rocky soil and whatnot and causes premature water main breaks and so forth. So we're not, we're getting a good use out of it, but not the extra life that some, you know, would hope. Uh, I think moving forward, we need to bump that up to maybe two miles a year. I think a 70 a year old pipe, if you did two miles a year and you had 130 miles. 70 year old pipe is uh, acceptable, 130 year old pipe is not. So um, we do need to ramp up that program. We, we, do, spend, we do utilize um, grant funding and uh, we're using some ARPA funding to help accelerate those program, but we, we do have a, a bit of work ahead of us to get a, a more advantageous place. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So. I don't think this question is for you, it's probably for Mr. Pooler. Please forgive me for asking this, but it's not quite 8 o'clock yet. But when I do the math, I don't get it, you know. So, so like the cost in mean, home use is 60, the example you give for 50 for the rates made up. So let's say you're using 60 CCF in a year, and then if you multiply that, let's say even by 9, you know, that just gives me like 540. But I'm seeing like a thousand one hundred thirty five there. I will defer to Mr. Rodemacher. He did the All right. math. All right. Uh sixty CCF, so I'd have to I, I could sit back and do some math at my chair and get back to you. Uh right. we we've done the a spreadsheet that calculates this out. All right. Uh well, it's about ten dollars. It's you 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 also have to add the water in the sewer, right? Oh, okay. So okay. All right. you, you might just be calculating on the water side. Yeah, I'm just but it yeah. doubles it when you add the sewer. Gotcha. Okay. So all right. Sewer. Fine. Fine. So, so, I'm a renter. <laughs> so, 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 so it's like that's all I'll just kind of behind the curtains for me. So so it's like we just pay for it. All right. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. Like I wouldn't have asked had it, had it not been before eight o'clock and they were asking questions they gave me time to like look <laughs> at stuff so all right thank you <laughs> almost, almost done. All right. so I think that's it we keep trying it's like one of those Facebook questions you, my <laughs> I go in the garden I have five tomatoes three apples like, oh yeah, no sorry. I'm not even going to try sorry okay, sorry right. no problem. so so the, uh, with that on a motion by uh, Mr. Hurd and second by Mr. Behan to approve the rates Mr. Hein. Mr. Hurd Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now to the real fun part of the meeting, the warrant article hearing. So uh, first up is Article 10, Bylaw Amendment, Vote Municipal Opt-in Specialized Stretch Energy Code. And um, with that, we have Mr. Ryan. I don't have your last name in front of me. Katowski. Katowski, thank you. Good evening. And I think we have some slides to bring up. Yeah, let me share the screen. And while those, are, while those are being brought up, I'm going to be very brief. Um, I'm Ryan Katowski. I'm chair of the Clean Energy Future Committee. And uh, after I just give a few remarks, uh, Talia Fox, who is the sustainability manager for the town, is going to go through some of the details. And we're going to also hear from uh, Karen Keller, who is going to talk about the, um, some of the uh, uh, affordable housing uh, aspects of what, we're what the warrant article is covering. I'm literally going to just cover the first slide. Um, we have a net zero action plan in town uh, to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2050. Some of you have probably heard me talk about this as being a journey. It's really a long process to get there. Uh, Warrant Article 10 is really the next step along that journey where we're asking the town, uh, town meeting to adopt uh, what's called the Specialized Stretch Energy Code. Um, this code is going to help us by making sure that new construction is compatible with that uh, 2050 goal. Um, and buildings are, if you look at the different sectors of the economy that we need to decarbonize, buildings are uh, a bit more challenging. And uh, this is a really important step in the process to making sure that we can ensure that by, by that target date that we've got uh, a decarbonized building sector. So with that, I'm going to give it over to Talia. 
Thanks, Ryan. I'm Talia Fox, the Sustainability Manager for the town. So I'm going to provide some details on the history here and that journey that Ryan was talking about. Arlington was one of the first communities to adopt the stretch code in the state. That was a code developed in 2009 to provide enhanced efficiency over the base code. The town did this in part as a requirement for becoming a green community. The Green Communities Program, as you may know, is a state grant program that allows communities in the state to access competitive grant funds for energy efficiency activities. Since Arlington became a green community in 2010, we've been able to access nearly $2 million in funding through that program. So building on this local leadership in 2018, the Select Board adopted a goal of achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. We've also demonstrated some leadership at the state level. In 2020, town meeting passed a clean heat home rule petition and bylaw amendment to ban fossil fuels in new construction and major renovations. Uh, in the same year, the select board, or the next year, the select board endorsed Arlington's net zero action plan, and Arlington filed its home rule petition with the state legislature because the state actually preempts this kind of fossil fuel ban. Um, in 2021, uh, the state also passed an act creating a next generation roadmap for Massachusetts climate policy, which is important because it mandated that the Department of Energy Resources, or DOER, <laughs> develop a municipal opt-in specialized code, which is what we're talking about tonight. <coughs> Arlington actually participated in the development of this code, including through 2022 town meetings passage of Article 73, a resolution calling for a true net zero opt-in code or a specialized code, which with provisions more stringent actually than those provisions uh, enshrined in the final code language. DOER finalized updates to the stretch code and the specialized code late in 2022. Also in 2022, the legislature passed an act driving clean energy and offshore wind, which among other things created a fossil fuel free demonstration project that will allow 10 municipalities that submitted clean heat home rule petitions to ban fossil fuels. So rather than approving those individual home rule petitions, this is a program that's gonna allow those communities to ban fossil fuels. Arlington does intend to participate this, in this program and I will discuss shortly why that's relevant to the specialized code discussion tonight. And we're here in 2023 and we're talking about uh, Article 10, which is for the specialized code. Um, the stretch code has also taken effect as of January 1st, and that's automatic for Arlington as a stretch code community. Next slide, please. So I wanna discuss uh, how Massachusetts energy codes work. They build successively on one another, their overlay codes. There are three codes. At the bottom of this pyramid is the updated base code which is the International Energy Conservation Code plus some Massachusetts specific amendments. On top of that is the stretch code, which is the base code plus stretch code amendments that are designed to make buildings even more efficient. And then on top of that is the opt-in specialized code, which is also known as the municipal opt-in code, also known as the specialized code. It's got lots of names. Some call it the super stretch code. Call it what you want. It is the stretch code plus specialized code appendices. Next slide. <coughs> So some important things to note here are that, as I mentioned, Arlington is a stretch code community. 300 communities in Massachusetts are stretch code communities, and all of the updates to the stretch code are automatic. So we don't have to do anything to be brought into those updates. The opt-in specialized code requires a town meeting vote. And I wanna note that five other communities in the state have already opted in. Those communities are Watertown, Somerville, Cambridge, Brookline, and Newton, and there are around 20 others that are planning to opt in this year. Next slide, please. Yeah. So I want to mention here that Arlington does intend to opt or to participate in that fossil fuel free demonstration project, which is noted at the top of the pyramid here because DOER has indicated that adopting the specialized stretch code will help to facilitate participation in that, uh, that pilot program. Next slide. So just to get into briefly what the specialized code actually does. I wanna clearly state that the specialized code applies to new construction only. It does not apply to major renovations. That's taken care of by the underlying stretch code, which again is automatic for Arlington. Requirements for new homes under the specialized code are summarized here. First, homes over 4,000 condition square feet that use fossil fuels must be net zero energy. Net zero energy means that enough energy is produced uh, by renewable energy, usually through on-site solar panels, to offset the total energy use, use of the building. 
Second, multifamily buildings over 12,000 conditioned square feet must be designed to meet the requirements of the highly efficient passive house standard. Passive house ensures superior building envelope and high performing mechanical systems to reduce energy use and enhance occupant comfort and health. Passive house actually does not ban fossil fuels. I just want to note that. Third, buildings that use fossil fuels must pre-wire for future electrification. That means that sufficient electrical capacity, circuits, and plugs would be needed to accommodate future electric heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, hot water service, and appliances. And last, buildings that use fossil fuels must install a certain amount of solar, uh, which varies by the, the type and size of the building, and there are exemptions for shaded sites and passive house buildings. You'll notice that most of the requirements here apply to buildings that use fossil fuels for any purpose. And so buildings that are all electric for the most part are actually not subject to any additional requirements under the specialized stretch code. My final slide uh, demonstrates the timeline for the process. Me. We've been doing public education over the last couple of months. We've made some presentations to local community groups. We've had several conversations with local architects and builders. Specifically, we held a forum for the development community on February 15th, which was very well attended, and a public forum on March, March 1st. DOER recommends a phase-in period for the code, which would begin this summer in Arlington should town meeting adopt the code. And we would be looking at a recommended effective date of January 1, 2024. And like with the stretch code, all future updates to the specialized stretch code would be automatic once we opt in. So that's going to conclude my presentation, and I'm just going to turn it over briefly to Karen Kelleher to say a, a word. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Karen Kelleher. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 5. I'm also the chair of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And in my day job, I'm the executive director of LISC Boston, which is a nonprofit community development financial institution and advocacy organization that supports the capacity of different parts of our community development ecosystem, including the affordable housing sector and the climate justice sector. Um, so in that both these capacities, I sort of want to talk just uh, briefly about this code and how it aligns with our affordable housing objectives in Arlington. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund did adopt a set of guiding principles which included aligning our affordable housing goals with our climate resiliency goals. And this code is one way that we can advance those principles. These requirements for multifamily affordable housing will not be a barrier to developing affordable housing. In fact, there's quite a bit of alignment with state policy and state regulators who award state subsidies have actually prioritized energy efficiency, electrification, and resiliency in the projects that they give priority to in, uh, under the state's qualified allocation plan. The passive house standard that's required for multifamily housing under the specialized stretch code is actually quite common in affordable housing at this point, and that's because of the work of advocates over the last decade to try to actually test passive house in the affordable housing context, and we've demonstrated that the incremental cost of passive house is really it's incremental. Um, I've got the conclusion right in my statement there. It's relatively incremental, and some of it is offset by energy savings um, in the operating period for the home. Um, my organization actually is written into the state's uh, subsidy regulations as the organization that has to provide support for the most energy efficient projects. So we have a lot of depth in really evaluating projects for energy efficiency and climate resiliency. This would be a tool that would just further push the state and the development community to ensure that there is consistency in incorporating this kind of uh, energy efficiency and resiliency into affordable housing. It's also healthier for the residents, provides cleaner air quality, and generally a nicer experience of living in the home. Thank you. Ha. Thank you. So, sorry, my colleagues. Okay, I'll be happy to take questions. I just want to note that we have a couple other experts here to answer your questions. Just wanted to introduce them. So on the line, I believe, is Mike Champa, who is our Director of Inspectional Services. Um, and we also have the honor of having uh, Ian Finlayson, who is the Deputy Director of, Energy Efficient, of the Energy Efficiency Division with DUER. So he basically <coughs> wrote the code, and he's sitting right here. He's also an Arlington resident. So right. we're very lucky to have him to, to answer any technical questions about the code itself. Right. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all. Uh, this is a little bit of deja vu for me. I have the good fortune of being the select board representative to not only the Clean Energy Futures Committee, after following uh, uh, an impressive run by Ms. Mahan, 
um, but also the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So hello. <laughs> and uh, but I've I've been I've had a front row seat to seeing the development of this thinking and this code and the advocacy and the thinking um, in the town. What an embarrassment of riches we have in Arlington. Such a deep bench, you know, sitting right in front of us of people with deep expertise in energy, in housing, um, with a, such a love for your community. And I think that that, and then coupled with the uh, incredible resource that we have in Ms. Fox and Mr. Pooler and the whole professional team to really make this happen. I, I'm just pleased as punch and really encouraged that um, in the case of, of affordable housing uh, financing, that this is not an impediment to the work that they're doing, and um, that the, the uh, communities that Ms. Fox cited have already adopted this clearly feel like this is not going to be an impediment to development in their communities where there's a lot of the development going on, so that's good information. The only question I have is if somebody could detail what the six month phase in period would look like and just help us understand uh, what that really is in practice. I'm wondering if Mike can support answering this question. Um, I think I'll just say that there is some leverage to design that process. It's meant to be an on-ramp uh, to support the development community. There are already many trainings um, provided. I, I, know, I know this has been expressed as, as a desire from, from contractors and builders to have support with that. Um, we, we provided that development forum um, earlier in, in February and I'm happy to support further training opportunities and education for the community locally in Arlington, but I think it would be a, a combination of education and ensuring that there are training opportunities available. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if Mike has anything to add based on his um, connection uh, with the local community. Yeah, so the, I mean, that's basically any time that there's a major change that goes into effects, there's, there's generally a six month period where, um, it, you know, for educational purposes and, and so it doesn't, um, you, you can't just put a regulation like that into effect like it immediately. Um, it gives everyone a chance to uh, become, you know, familiar with what needs to be done and it, find out, you know, how they're going to be building in the future. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had this tickle that won't go away. Um, thank you for uh, presenting this. Um, I have a question, and I'm not probably going to pose it artfully, so, but I'm going to do my best and, and hope that you figure out what I'm asking. But I do understand that, you know, we're pending taking any public comment, going to have a vote on this, I certainly would um, vote for it, but I want to wait till we get to the public hearing part. But my question would be, um, <coughs> one of the really um, exciting things about um, net zero, clean energy, climate resiliency, um, for a lay person like myself, um, and I'm not a builder and I'm not in um, the building trades in any capacity right now, is there's an awful lot of, um, uh, I don't want to say opportunities. What I'm wondering is, as we move forward, and I understand um, we're meeting with the builders to educate them in terms of what this new stretch code means. <clears throat> is there a way, I've, I've just seen, just saw a flourishment of all these green energy companies, whether it's companies of two to 200 on everything with communities striving to uh, get to net zero. And um, because it's a brand new field, um, I'm just wondering, and I'm not saying this is a requirement, but is there something for builders that we're either giving them as guidance to say as you move forward and you make these uh, accommodations uh, or you, you put in place so that whether it's passive house or brand new construction and you're doing the top tier, um, either what they should look out for when they're either purchasing the actual equipment, when they're purchasing a company that's brand new because this is a brand new field, or is it we're going to give builders the guidance on this is what the code is, this is what it means, and everybody's just going to do trial and error and it's sort of word of mouth, like, you know, I hired, you know, Mahan, net zero consulting and the hardware 
broke down and duct tape didn't even work and they didn't really have the expertise. So I've asked that question, not outfully, but I, I was wondering if anyone or any ones could take a crack at that. And I'm just curious, I'm not saying it's something the town should do, but uh, and maybe the state's doing it. So that's my big encompassing question. I'll take a stab at this and then maybe somebody else can chime in if, if they have a, another answer here. But um, so one thing that I thought was exciting at our developer forum is we had a local HERS rater, so a, um, an expert on, on the energy efficiency requirements as part of the, the stretch code. We had him speak a little bit about his experience um, achieving buildings with a, a very high level of efficiency what exactly what type of windows he used and, and what were the specific requirements of the mechanical equipment and the spray foam insulation. And so I'm hopeful that there can be more examples that are, are shared among, among builders uh, about what it takes to get to some of these requirements. I do think the state is uh, providing that to an extent. I know MassSave is putting on a lot of trainings, but um, if there's any way that we can help to encourage that conversation, I, I'm, you know, I'm open to, to doing that. I don't know if, Mike, you have anything to add here, or, or even if Ian has something to add about what the state is, is doing to encourage um, that, that sharing of resources and examples. Hopefully that gets at your question. Sure. Do you want to jump in before he answers, or? No, I mean, if right. I can. I can just, yeah. I think any plans for new construction will get submitted to the building department for review prior to issuance of a permit. So that would be once the building department issues a permit, and Mike can confirm that's the building department saying that your plans comply with what's necessary to build. So I think it, during that process, once this comes into play, is when the building department, if they get plans that don't incorporate these changes, tell the applicants you are denied your permit, you have to update your plans to conform with this, this, and this. So I think, and I certainly understand where there's local business builders that come in to get the the word out ahead of time so you don't have that step and drag down the building department with plans that they have to review that don't confirm, conform. But I think at least prior to the step of them building the property and the building department coming in and say, oh, you, you spent $100,000 to build this property and you have to rip down the walls. I think those can be caught in the plan review stage. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump into you. No, no, no. But, but my question based around, case in point, there's a, a building in Boston on Federal Street, and I won't say the number. Um, construction company that was the main construction company is no longer in business, blazing granite. Big, huge lawsuit. I started out in land court. Big, huge lawsuit, and just from my novice observation, Basically, what happened was one of the many subcontractors, and this is 25, 30 years ago, um, and there were new codes coming in, it really came down to a subcontractor that they hired besides crafts being done out of order, really messed up and didn't have any confidence to doing correct chalk lines. And as it went through a land court, it became evident in the field that this wasn't a one-time thing. Um, so the, the thing I'm asking for is, you know, once they get the plans and they know, is there like a list of these are sort of approved by Mass Save by the town of Arlington? I'm not saying there should be. I'm just wondering, uh, or is, is that something, this is a brand new field and all these companies are, are breaking out and we're going to have to do trial by error? So I, I know Mass Save does have lists of certain equipment that meets their standards in order to be able to access incentives. Um, I believe also lists of certain contractors. Um, Mike, did you have a hand raised? I just want to. Yeah, so um, it, it's not really, uh, they, they don't necessarily need um, a whole new education. It's, it's just a new way of doing, um, if, if they're already, so they're already building these homes. Um, and it's more who they have on their team now. Like obviously, they need a hers rater. They, you know, they need to um, be a little more up to date on, on the, you know, the efficiency of equipment that they need to install. But it's not so much changing um, the landscape of, of building a home that 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 you need, a, you know, that you need someone who's uh, has 10 years of experience in in building green homes or in building passive homes. The, you know. 
the, the regulations allow for pathways that are um, that the the process is completely familiar to the builders out there today. Okay, thank you. And I, I only ask that question as we're moving forward with our financial outlook, um, mm -hmm. and we're going to be discussing an override in the future. I know when I walk in the whole array of coffee shops, etc., that um, when I'm selling a possible override, anytime there's anything new that you're doing something different, a different way, or it's brand new, um, when I'm trying to get those people, sometimes I may not even change their mind at all, just coming, but I can see the question where they're saying, and now you tell me it's going to cost me an arm and a leg, and I got to find new people and how to build this house, and and that's why I asked all those questions. I still, you know, of, the, of that smattering of people, I still may not convince all of them, but I just want to be able to go back and say that, you know, this is what I've heard from the committee, what I've heard from um, the building inspector. Um, thank you. That's the reason. I didn't ask it just to ask it. There sure. was a reason. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. sure. So I think at this point, I think she's satisfied with the answer, yeah. so we can <coughs> you know, stop. Do you make a motion? Do you, do you, you make a motion? No. no, no. Um, just one question about the slide. Where it said houses have to be pre-wired, is that new construction? That wasn't clear to me in that slide. Okay. So it's not like some guy that's had his house for 50 years has to go retrofit his house. All right, I just want to make sure, because I was trying to think in my head, how are you going to police that, for one thing. But yeah, that all makes sense to me. And again, I. I'm with my colleagues on this. I'm happy to support. I think this is Arlington's shown leadership in this area. It's actually surprising that we're behind five other communities, but that's okay. Um, and so I'm happy to uh, move forward and continue us down that road. I, I, I said this during our discussion about the fossil fuel infrastructures. I renovated my house a couple of years ago, and we use the new electric uh, heating and cooling systems, and they're amazing. They're much better than my old fossil fuel heating system that we have downstairs. So I wish I had it downstairs. Maybe, maybe next time. But um, so I'm happy to support the scheme. Yes. I, thank you. I do have another question. Uh, what is it, for the purposes of this, uh, this, the effect, this being an effect for new construction? When someone like leaves just a wall up, you know, but it's really just a tear down of the house, would that is that would that sort of Qualifies new construction for this, or would that be uh, a renovation, <laughs> albeit a major one? Um, so I'm, I'm guessing that our, our, our uh, special services director might might have some insight into this. Yeah. So uh, a, a home isn't considered a new home unless it's uh, completely torn down, new foundation, um, and it, it you know. They would they would still be required to do a lot more than they previously were, but um, the the whole point of these regulations is that uh, you know, the efficiency goes comes from the the footing of the uh, the footing of the house to the roof. It, it, so um, they would be required to for stricter regulations than if you know than obviously than just a renovation, but it's not a new home. Okay, thank you. Yes, well, I'm, I'm very much in favor of this. So I just want to let people um, on Zoom know that um, um, we're, 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 you know, we're, we're leaning very strongly towards this. You know, so if you have anything um, new to add, we're happy to hear from you. But we'll hear from you anyways because it's a hearing, and, and we'll um, spend a half hour max on this. So um, if you bring up the timer for three minutes, you know. I see one hand raised at this time. Okay, great. So uh, we'll take Mr. Hammond. Sorry, there are a lot of buttons to push. Yes. Uh, I'm hoping you can hear me. Just fine. Um, my name is Patrick Hanlon. I'm from Precinct 5 uh, on Park Street. Um, and I've been with this process now for a very long time, uh, going all the way back to uh, the first fossil fuel uh, bylaw. And I submitted a letter that dealt with the issues uh, in general, and I just wanted to 
say something briefly about some of the discussion that has happened in the last few minutes. Um, major renovations is one of those things that last year in the resolution that town meeting passed, we wanted to make sure it was covered by uh, the specialized code. Um, and that's one of the points on which uh, our uh, urgings on DOER did not prevail. Um, but the demonstration project that Talia referred to would cover major renovations, including the kind, including the gut renovations that we see constantly, at least on my side um, of, of Arlington. Um, and it's very important ultimately to take a step beyond what we're doing tonight or what you're doing tonight uh, and town meeting will do in April um, to know that there's more that needs to be done. And that's one of the things that needs to be done is to address what is actually one of the biggest categories of building in a, in a, town, like, in a town like ours. And all of the other communities that have done the stretch code, uh, the, have done the demonstration project are pretty much in the same boat. Second is I think that Ms. Mahan is on a really important point that ultimately when we get, this is going to start slowly, there's only a certain amount of new building that takes place, but there's more that will be taking place in the future and eventually uh, there will be renovations and so on. And taking a step like we're hoping to do now is something that helps create a market of people who know how to do these things and can do them efficiently and can do them economically. Uh, and I think that that is one of the important things that happens when you take a major step forward like this. With respect to compliance with the regulations, much of what the new stretch code and the new specialized stretch code would do is have you go out and retain a hearse raider who now does modeling that's a little different from what he would do before in order to get things down to or to <coughs> assess that things are down to the right level. The same thing is true of passive house certifiers. So a lot of the lack of knowledge that may happen at the local level, people will be buying by going to people who've been doing this for years. Over time, that capacity is gonna to have to expand and that's an important point. Uh, but you have to take the step now to be able to create the market that will support the much more energetic matters that we'll have to do in the future. So I'm pleased to hear that you're, uh, you're leaning towards this and hope that you will, uh, you will pass it. It's a step, but it's an important step, and Arlington needs to take it. Thank you, Ms. Hanlon. Any other um, hands? I'm not seeing any. Anyone in the room? I think. No, see you in the hands. Okay, Mr. Halpin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd love to move approval for this and recommend a positive action to town meeting. I am deeply proud that Arlington is a leader and, and I'm grateful for Mr. Hanlon's comments reminding us that there's, there's more room for us to grow here and to do even better than this. But this is an excellent foundation. I think that we are really walking the talk when we talk about sustainability and, and um, moving towards the, the critical goal of net zero carbon emissions. So. Thank you again for your work on this. Second. Any other questions, comments? All I'll say is that the five communities that we were behind are very good communities. And I think all of them are cities except for Watertown. You know, so. No, Watertown's a city. That's true. We, we, that's it true. Is, that's, true. Is, that's true. That's true. And, and, five, I, I, huh? What's that? What's that? I don't know. Uh, so. Let's not debate with <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, let's not. Uh, it might be one. All right, thank you, Bob. And, and I'm going to trust from your position that you, you know, Caroline Bayes, I mean, would, would give me a hard time about messing she, that up. Yes, she would. And, uh, and, and so, um, and, um, well, I just have to use this. You know, there's no need to stretch this out. So we're just going to move along. Can I hear that again? Oh. <laughs> Can I hear with it? <laughs> Sorry. So, Sorry. So, and also, I was kind of wondering what's the next, next what the next one was going to be. If it's going to be like the super, the, you know, super yeah. <laughs> stress, stress, stress but but what really? I'm kind of what is in the works next? I mean, is there something like I me? Mean, are we thinking like another level? You know, um, yeah. But sometimes you know when like a new OS comes out, it's like you know I, I we already have the next one already in the works. I mean, and and. 
I, well, maybe Ian can actually answer this, and we should probably use his expertise since we brought him here. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, I, I think the next step is definitely the, the fossil fuel demonstration project, at least in the immediate term, which we can discuss perhaps another time. Um, but I don't know if, Ian, if you would like to speak to the, to the next horizon for, sure, for the stretch sure. code development, sure. that would be great. Thanks. Uh, Ian Fenlison, I'm a resident of uh, Russell Terrace and I also work for the Department of Energy Resources. Um, I'm, I'm going to first take the opportunity to address one of the earlier questions about the transition and preparing people. Um, so I think one of the biggest changes between the stretch code and the specialized code and the naming is the fault of the legislature rather than, <laughs> than DOER um, or the inspiration. <laughs> Um, one of the major differences was mentioned earlier, and that's the requirement for a passive house for multifamily buildings. So um, we introduced passive house as an optional pathway in the building code back in 2012. And then from then on, we started funding demonstration projects and uh, workforce training and so on. Um, and in the current mass safe budget, there's, I think, $1.6 million dollars available for passive house training and technical assistance. That's spread over the three year period that we're in now from 2022 to 2024. So I, I say all that just to give you a, some context that we're not just sort of springing this on the design community. Uh, there's been a long engagement with the affordable housing community in particular. Um, and the Masse program has a little over 10,000 units of housing that are currently in the pipeline to meet passive house standards. So, so we're definitely looking at growing the market and building the market and building the expertise in the design and construction community before we bring things into building code. Um, so to give you a couple of examples to actually answer the question about what's coming next, um, one is that when we put out a straw proposal last year for what should be in the stretch code and specialized code, um, we had provisions for measuring embodied carbon. And so that's the carbon that's in the materials that go into the construction. Things like concrete are very carbon intensive. Um, other materials can, can have a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with production. And um, the response we got from a lot of public comments um, was that maybe that would be rushing something into the market quite quickly. So we are continuing to do our homework on that. Um, tomorrow I will be working on a funding request from the federal government for uh, additional funding to do more research on, on that area. We're also looking at, you know, as people get more solar panels and more battery storage and more electric vehicles and also water heaters with heat pumps that are all electric, can we use those resources as storage during the day um, so that we can then take those uh, demand uses offline during peak periods. And then new construction can actually contribute to the electric grid. Um, whereas at the moment we see new construction as sort of adding pressure on the electric grid, it can actually be helpful to the, the electric grid and, and reduce costs and, and damage, quite frankly, when there's uh, peak hour congestion on the grid. Um, so there are a couple of areas. Um, a third one that I think is worth mentioning is commercial building retrofits and how do we handle those in the building code in the most uh, cost effective and sustainable manner. So that's about as far as my crystal ball goes, but those are things that we're already working on that will be coming at some point in the future. Nice. Well, thank you. Thank you. That was, that was informative. Very interesting. I appreciate it. So, on a motion to move positive action uh, on this article by Mr. Helmuth and a second by Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. All righty. So, article number 14. I'm going to ask that um, we table this you know, until um, after the election. You know, um, Primarily because the you know, because it's me, you know, and, and I really don't want me to put my colleagues in any kind of awkward 
position because I really want you to vote me what you think would be the correct vote in your heart. And it's not that you wouldn't, but I just want it to be completely, completely easy. Uh, I told you, as easy as possible for you, you to do that and not worry about me any optics. I mean, if um, you know, you want to vote a different way. I mean, uh, uh, and 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 then it kind of brings up the general um, situation about how we handle the I mean, articles. I mean, that are um, put up I mean, by members of the select board. The reason um, we're here uh, is because we, and I think it was the last meeting before the warrant closed, which was a Monday, and the, the, the warrant was going to close four days later. And I had been to an uh, uh, LRP meeting I mean, the previous Friday, and it was just I mean, really um, taken by the need for us to generate new growth, because I mean, that really would help with, you know, with the override. You know, and, and I really wanted to figure out how we could do that, you know, and I kind of remembered how um, we formed a study committee I mean, for the Youth and Young Adult Advisory Board, and that gave us a lot of insult, insights, but more so what that did was it allowed us to have a conversation with the community, you know, and I felt that would be even more so the case uh, with this, you know, and, and with the Youth and Young Adult Advisory Board, you know, it was my first year on uh, the board, you know, uh, and I had proposed it as an article, and it was taken up by the select board, and I just kind of figured that was automatic, you know. But but we were having uh, a moment, you know, about how the select board handles uh, proposing articles, I mean, and when I suggested it, it, it um it had a, it, there was no response to it, so so I could have either waited another year, you know, and I thought you know what I'll just go out and, and get get it as a. A resident. And I was happy I did, you know, because I really got to engage with people as I talked with them about it. It, it kind of sharpened the idea. It made me realize me that there was some um, reception to it. So I came out of it thinking, you know, we should all, I mean, anytime anyone from the select board wants to have an article in the warrant, should go out just like a resident and, and, and get it. Uh, you put it on. But then that does bring up how do we handle it? I mean, and so should we then, like, always have it such that? I mean, um, any article put about it, it's like board, it's heard after the election season. That's for us to sky, and it's not the conversation to have now because it wasn't on the agenda of the discussion. And I'm just kind of giving you the, uh, the prelude to it, you know. But, but I was having a conversation, and it was like, okay, well, if you were to move forward this now, I mean, would you, the chair, like, turn it over to the vice chair and defend it? I mean, or would you just go to the microphone, you know? Um, and defend it, you know, just from here, because when it came to the Youth and Young Adult Advisory Board, everyone knew that I had put that forward, I mean, and I kind of made the case for it, I mean, and, the, and the board uh, selected and put positive action to move it to, um, to, to town meeting. So I asked Mr. Hines to just kind of let the board know, like, how is it, I mean, uh, how we should handle the you know, article uh, put up by a member of the select board, either now or after the election. So, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as the board knows, the board generally acts as a body when the select board is putting its name behind something. That doesn't mean that you can't file a resident petition article. While a resident petition article sort of has a main proponent and a voice and a face attached to it, the reality is that resident petition article is signed by at least 10 registered voters. So. Uh, Mr. Diggins can certainly propose an article to the board and can advocate on behalf of it, and the board can ask questions the same way you'd ask any other um, proponent of an article and open it up for public comment. Um, you know, in this particular case, the manager, other folks might have some perspective on it, but, um, you know, the long and short of it is, is that the board certainly, there's no rule that prohibits a board member from signing a resident petition and putting it forward. You just treat the chair of the board as uh, the petitioner. I don't necessarily think, Mr. Diggins, that some specific process needs to be handled in the sense that, you know, you're the chair of the board, you're allowed to vote on your own warrant article. It's not like a conflict of interest type of situation. Um, I think that the board is pretty magnanimous with one another. If maybe you had a slightly more contentious uh, collegial relationship, it would be different. But I think that you could proceed essentially as normal. Whether or not you believe as a group that you'd like to wait until after um, the election in some way, shape, or form, I think it's really up to, to you to decide. I don't think I would feel comfortable commenting on that specific portion of things. Thank you. 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 Thank
Okay, I appreciate that, Mr. Herb. Um, I'm happy to, re to respect your wishes, but I don't see any reason why we can't just take this up <laughs> and you can be the chair of the meeting. I don't feel any undue influence right. with you as why? the chair I to, I uh, <laughs> if we disagree with it, then we disagree. I happen, I'm fine with the article that you're proposing. So, I, and I think just from a practical standpoint to push a warrant article hearing out, you know, a couple of weeks could delay the delivery of the second ham, um, yeah, the handbook report and whatnot. So, I mean, I would, I'm happy to hear from my colleagues, but I don't see any reason why we can't just take this up. Yeah. Well, um, Mr. Helen. Thank you, Mr. Hurt. Uh, I actually would, move, uh, would like to move to postpone to April 3rd uh, for this to a date certain. Um, I think, but I, first question for our board administrator, Ms. Marr, do you see, foresee any difficulty uh, with the sequence of that affecting the production of the select board report? <coughs> no. On April 3rd, we'll actually have three other warrant article hearings at that time, so it would be appropriate to move to that date. So we have to think about you know, everything else we have to, we have to do. Um, I think two things. Um, I actually, just for myself, would, would appreciate the courtesy that, that the chair is suggesting for um, just having the freest possible discussion and vote. Uh, but I also, and, and Mr. Corsi, of course, isn't here as well, um, but I also uh, would like to know if uh, town staff, you know, have, town staff have an opportunity to weigh in on this, if the ARB has a view on this. Um, I think that they're relevant party to the conversation as well, and I'd like to give them a little bit of time to prepare. Second. Yeah. Um, that's yeah, fine please. with me, and I, I guess I would just ask um, ARB sort of fold that into the planning department because I know we hired a consultant to look at the industrial zone, and et cetera, et cetera. And I just don't want to. I want to make sure that you have all the information moving forward when you do the compilation of the committee to report to the 2025 town meeting versus the. 20,225, I assume that will be <laughs> corrected as we move forward. Unless maybe we're giving you the gift of almost longevity and perpetuity that you have to report back to the 20,225 yeah. So that's fine, thank I you. I, I saw that, I thought I'd taken it out, but, but <laughs> just so you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm working on a sci-fi movie <laughs> that's like set, being that movie book book that's set out. So um, I think Mr. Hart seconded Mr. Um, Helmut's motion to yeah. table to April third, so I won't yeah. I won't third it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah, I'm, and yeah, I, I, I need some, um, I, I need a little more time, you know, you know, I need my my little ducks that were in a row kind of got out of a row a little bit, so I need to figure out what's going on. So, so there's that. And so thank you though, and I appreciate it. And so on a motion to table to the third by. Um, Mr. Helmuth and a second by Mr. Hurd. Hi. Mr. Hurd? This is maybe an annoying question, but do we have to ask for public comment on our motion to table? Not if you're not going to substantively okay. address the one argument. Yep. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hurd, Mr. Helmuth, Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. It's a 4 0 vote. Thank you. Mr. Chick, I just asked Ms. Morrison. Yeah. Sorry, I was just answering the email real quick. They needed an address, that's all. That's all. Uh -huh. Okay. Sure, sure. Right. I forget it. I forget anyways. So it's like, yeah. so it's like uh, all righty, so we are on to Article 15, Vote Board of Youth Services Updates. And I don't have on my notes who it's associated with, so that's why I'm not calling out the names. Um, they have, there's someone with their hand raised. Okay. Kristen Barnacle. Okay, yep. I'll promote them at this time. Okay, thank you.
Hi. Hi. How you doing? Good. How are you? Doing fine. Hey, so um, let's hear the rationale behind Article 15. Sure. So uh, for starters, uh, my name is Kristen Barnacle. I have lived in East Arlington since 2010, and I've served on the Board of Youth Services since 2016. I'm the designated spokesperson tonight, but also on the Zoom are Justine Block, who's the chair of the board, and Colleen Legere, who is the director of the Arlington Youth Counseling Center. So as you see, the Board of Youth Services is looking to make some updates to better reflect our role and to ensure that the board remains vibrant and reflective of the community. Uh, for starters, we'd like to change our name. Our primary role is to support and provide guidance to the Arlington Youth Counseling Center, AKA AYCC. We lead fundraising efforts to support AYCC as it strives to meet the ever-growing demand for its services. We organize community-wide events where patient, uh, parents and other residents can hear from speakers about mental health issues facing our youth. And we collaborate with other town organizations to support youth, for example, with the Holiday Help Program. So we would like to change our name to accurately reflect this role. Um, our recommendation is that we change the name from the Board of Youth Services to the AYCC Advisory Board. A key reason the board began discussing a number of changes is that we've had difficulty recruiting new board members. So as part of the exercise we've done over the past year, we've developed a job description for board members. We've reduced our meeting schedule from monthly to quarterly, and we've created subcommittees to work on specific initiatives. We anticipate these changes will help with recruitment, so we're holding off on any recruitment until we receive town meeting approval. So just a snapshot of our current board, we have eight board members, all are white women, two have high school age children. The rest of us have kids who've already gone through the Arlington Public Schools. All of us have served for more than one term, most have served for more than two, and many for much longer. So we're an awesome board, we're dedicated to AYCC, but we see the need for diversity of perspectives and lived experiences. And so we think there are three vehicles that could create, maintain a more diverse and vibrant board. One is allowing people who work with youth in Arlington, but don't necessarily live in Arlington to be board members. The second is to institute term limits, one three-year term um, with the opportunity to renew for a second three-year term. And then having some flexibility about the number of board, mem board members, so no less than seven, but no more than 11, depending on how recruitment goes. So um, I'd like to invite Colleen Legere to speak, um, just to give some words of support if she is able to join. I would just ask that she raise her hand in Zoom. Oh. We're having, there we go, thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, it's a little tricky when you join. It takes a minute to redirect. We're having a little technical difficulties with the attendee list as well. So. In the meantime, if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer. Is she ready? Is she on? Yes. Okay, she's all right, here. yeah. I have not seen any hands here, so we can. Hello. Hi, good evening. How are you? I'm fine. Um, Kristen, thank you. Um, and thank you for reviewing the proposal. And just again, I'm Colleen Legere. I'm the director of the Arlington Youth Counseling Center. And first, I would like to say that this board, most of the members on this board have been um, in support of AYC, acting on this board for a number of years, some as long as I've been there for 10 years or more. Um, and they have been really integral in, in supporting the agency um, and helping us achieve um, financial um, sustainability, as that has been our goal over the past few years. And we've also grown uh, in capacity with the support of the board to um, try to meet the demand for mental health services among youth and families in the community. And making these, <clears throat> making these adjustments, um, but looking at the structure and the composition I think will really help us to respond in a, in a thoughtful and equitable way in meeting those needs of the community. Um, and, you know, especially with the term limits and involvement of 
providers in the community who may not live in the community, I think could be a beneficial asset um, as, as Krista mentioned in their lived experience and um, their expertise in advising AYCC as we move forward in the next five, 10 years. Right. So I thank you for, for considering this proposal. Thank you. So I'll turn to my colleagues, Mr. Holland. Thank you. The, uh, the AYCC is such a valuable resource in town and, and it's incredibly important, it always has been, but I think we've seen with the past years and the cumulative stress on young people and families, particularly with the pandemic and, and other economic stresses that uh, the need is greater than ever and I'm really grateful for all that you do to meet that need and I'm very happy to support uh, these changes. One question I have for you is, if, um, and I could probably find this in the detail, but you, you know the answer off the, off the top of your head. If, is there a, a uh, does it specify with respect to having somebody be a member who doesn't live in the community? Are there, are, is that, could the whole board be made up of non-residents in theory? Not that you'd do that, but you know, or is there, is there a limitation on that? Is it one or two slots? What's, what's the vision for that um, non-resident membership? That's a great question. We didn't get that specific, but um, I think it may, would make sense mm -hmm. to to come up with some guidelines about, um, you know, off the top of my head, no more than 50% would be mm -hmm. um, non-residents, but um, I don't know, Colleen, if you have thoughts about that. I agree. Great question uh, or great suggestion. Um, I I'd, I'd agree, I'd, or maybe even fewer than that could be non-residents. Um, I think also critical, the parent of younger children, that perspective is important. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are providers, there are teachers, or providers in the community I think who equally could contribute their perspective, mm -hmm. um, and many of them don't live in the community. And what's, um, the, what's the proposed size of the board? It would, it would be as many as 11, and as few as seven. Do you, could you um, recommend an appropriate cap for non-residents? Kristen, did you? We didn't, but we yeah. we could. Okay, yeah, um, that's fine. And I admit, Attorney Heim is raising his hand. I think may have some insight that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Mr. Heim, just to be clear, uh, the board is currently 11. I think what they're asking for is more flexibility to have a larger or smaller board depending upon the essentially level of um, volunteers that are trying to get into mm -hmm. these slots. We've had similar situations with boards in the past where we've sort of uh, constructively shrank them depending on conditions mm -hmm. that would require some sort of vote either of the board itself, mm -hmm. the Board of Youth Services, um, or another body. Um, if the board would like some details to be sorted out, but you're inclined towards positive action, it's something I'd be happy to work with Ms. Legere or Ms. Barnacle on any of those details in terms of just sketching it out into a more specific vote and comment. That, that's fine. Uh, thank you. And the reason I'm asking this is I'm aware that the uh, Civilian Police Advisory Commission gives the Board of Youth Services, which would be renamed a nomination for, for that. So my thinking is uh, I'm not necessarily opposed to non-residents have a voice in that, but I think I would want to make sure that the majority of the board at least would be, would be Arlington residents and maybe even more than that. And, uh, and maybe in the line, uh, my suggestion might be along the lines of that refined specific motion, Attorney Heim, uh, to contemplate if it would be possible or prudent or practical to make the motion, uh, create the motion in such a way that it would address this specific issue of appointments mm -hmm. um, so that that could be perhaps restricted community residents or not, I don't know. And I think you'd, I would, wanna, I would want to, uh, to, to get the professional um, input from our, from our professionals here and our volunteers. Um, but, um, but I do recognize that the nature of this board, it's a professional practice and we want to be able to avail ourselves of sufficient expertise, including that, that might be outside the community, but would include people who know and care about Arlington families and youth. So that would be my suggestion. That, that's all. 
I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, I believe Mr. Helmuth. If I may, Mr. Helmuth. Yes, yes, Attorney. Just, just one thing to note about the um, Police Civilian Advisory Board, uh, which is an interesting safeguard that was kind of baked into it. Each of the yeah. appointing authorities, actually, they're not actually appointing authorities, they're nominating it's authorities. Nominee, yes, yes. And the manager has the final appointment. Correct. So there is a little bit of extra, That's true. if you will. So I, I just wanted to note it for the yeah. purpose of your discussion. Thank you. So, based on Mr. Helmuth's comments, are you looking for us to discuss a figure as far as a percentage or have them come back? I mean, I, I certainly understand the concern. I don't anticipate that our Arlington board is going to get flooded with non resident applicants. Um, I would say it, it was probably more prudent to come up with a percentage figure versus if we're going to have a give them the leeway to have a 7 to 11 member board just to say x percent off the top of my head I I'm thinking one third percent <laughs> and that would give you mm -hmm. if you were seven members yet that would be no more than two um, sorry attorney Hamm. I'm sorry to interject I just Mr. Chairman I, it does get tricky and one of the things we've learned from some of these more exper experimental ways of, of, of populating boards, it does get tricky with percentages because everybody's terms don't necessarily line up well. And you wouldn't want to have somebody kicked off the board because the percentage gets... So if there's a number, um, in some ways that number might be helpful. Maybe that number should be on the lower end of things. But, you know, if you wanted to say at least five members... I, of the, I'm sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. No. Well, I guess on, on that, if you say 7 to 11 and 9 is the, the median, then you go with 3, <laughs> one third of 9. So I guess that, that would be my proposed number. If we're looking for a number tonight, I don't... More than 3 being the numbers. Right. No more than 3 non residents. Yeah. And I, and I think I, you know, I encourage you know, to, to work with, with the folks who I have uh, ambushed with this question. Not my intention because it didn't occur to me. I ambushed myself with it tonight. So um, <laughs> in, in the moment, but, uh, but you know, to work to work with them and if you have feedback on that, I'd certainly be happy to hear that. Thank you, Mr. Hurd, for rescuing my yeah. fragment of an idea. Yeah. Was just and of saying. course, Tom Meadie can feel free to Absolutely. amend yes. that to whatever extent they That's prefer. Right. Yes. Yeah. I was just wondering if we still run into that problem I mean, with overlapping terms, I mean, if, it, if the number, but we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. you know, run a simulation. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, it is a hearing, you know, so. Um, uh, let's see if anyone in Zoom land or here wants to say anything. <laughs> Raise your hand electronically if you want to speak. Seeing no hands now, raised. You know, so. All right, it's back to us. Move, cool. And, uh, second. All right, All right uh, any other discussion? All right, well, I'm definitely in favor, and, and, and so uh, uh, I'm happy to see uh, you here, you know, and uh, trying to do something to, to uh, keep the board, and, um, uh, well, actually make it more more diverse, I mean, and, and it's, a, it's a good move, and, and also see I mean, some a lot of potential I mean, for uh, the Young Arlington Collaborative to work um, with with you all, I think, I mean, I think it's a, I think the two, yeah, I think the two really work well together. I mean, I, I was a little bit concerned when, when um, I saw this that you were thinking about folding, you know, or, and I'm glad that's not the case, I mean, because you, you um, provide great work, you know, so. All righty, uh, so on a motion to move positive action by Ms. Mahine, and second by Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurt. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. all right. So, um, can you tell us? We're going to um, Article 17, so... Oh, so thank yeah, you, that's my cue. Uh, Mr. Chair, I need to recuse myself as I did the first time this came up. Uh, no offense at all to Mr. Slotnick, 
but uh, because I'm employed by the legislature, uh, I'm required by conflict of interest law to use myself. That's just my problem. Okay. So, so we were picking up you know, and, uh, where we left off on this, I think. So <coughs> who's going to lead us in the discussion on this? Which, which two? Uh, good evening, I'm Larry Slotnick. Um, I live in Precinct 7 in East Arlington. Uh, so I, I was here as the proponent of Article 17 two weeks ago. Um, we, I, I didn't come in two weeks ago with the actual language of the article. Uh, in the uh, succeeding two weeks, I worked with Attorney Heim to develop, uh, Mr. Heim mostly developed the specific language for uh, what would be a proposed bylaw, which uh, <coughs> I'm not completely sure it's been circulated to the select board. Um, we have it. Okay. Yeah. Um, also during the hearing two weeks ago, I believe a request was made to uh, Mr. Pooler uh, to uh, survey the department heads that I had surveyed and gotten a limited response to. Um, I'm not sure uh, Mr. Pooler received results from uh, his inquiries in that direction. So I'm here to answer questions that come up uh, unless you need me to sort of re-present uh, the idea behind uh, allowing digital legal notices. I think we're all set with that. So um, Mr. Hyde, Mr. Pooler. Uh, I did conduct a survey both by email and then at the last department heads meeting we had a discussion among all the department heads about their use of uh, digital notices. Uh, I think there was generally very uh, favorable reception to this idea. There was a lot of concern uh, that at some point, uh, if there is no local paper, uh, it's going to mean um, it's going to get a lot more expensive to publish digital notices. Um, and I thought, and people were receptive, I think both the idea of uh, having the ability to choose either to put a notice in a local print paper or uh, a local online source. I think there was a lot of uh, perception too that uh, the town website um, is probably a place where a lot of people would go to look for information about any kind of legal notices or legal procedures. Um, we already uh, do that now when we do, for example, bids where we're required to put it uh, on the state registry uh, when we put out RFPs. We also put those on the town website and you can go back and look back for years to see what those documents were. Um, so uh, I would say the overall feeling among the department heads was that they would welcome a change to give them a little more flexibility and a great concern that at some point soon they're going to need a change like this. Otherwise, they're really going to get stuck uh, paying a lot of money for notices that would run in the Globe or Herald, which I don't know how many people in Arlington would then look at to try to find. Mr. Hahn. Uh, Ms. Jenkins, just to provide some additional con uh, context, what I did was I took some of the comments and concerns of the board uh, with what Mr. Slotnick's presentation and just our general idea was, along with the uh, feedback that the manager garnered. And I tried to put together something that essentially would authorize the board to decide um, what the adequate means of publication only for town notices. This isn't for anybody else. This is just for town, essentially, legal ads. And so it will be, if this was passed, it would be up to you to decide up to two, I mean, I'm sorry, at least two from this list of five. So that would be a newspaper of local or general circulation, germane to what Mr. Hurd's sort of feedback was that there are people who still um, uh, like to get these notices in the newspaper. A newspaper's website would be a second one. Websites reporting local news and opinion which satisfy all cr criteria for digital publication set forth in Chapter 4, Section 13B. What that essentially is, is if you had some of the online type of resources we have in Arlington, you wouldn't necessarily be able to satisfy it by putting it on the A list unless it was something that was accessible and had the capacity to essentially archive legal notices for people's accessibility. So there's some standard baked in there. 
Um, fourth would be a statewide website, which is sort of already in the law. And then fifth would be the town's website. So essentially the authority to decide what's sufficient legal notice would be vested with the board. And a majority vote of the board would decide, okay, for right now, there's a newspaper of local circulation. It's going to be a newspaper uh, and it's going to be Town the town's website. Um, if at a certain point in time it just doesn't become practical anymore for that to be the case, you could take another vote and you could say, look, it's, it's not economically feasible. These ads in the Globe, for example, cost twice as much as they cost in the Advocate, which is about right. Four times. Four times, okay. Even more than that. Sorry, Larry. Uh, and um, we're going to take a vote to um, amend this. The only other detail, I wouldn't say wrinkle, just detail in it is I don't, the very few circumstances in which the school department should run legal ads, but to the extent that they do, I vested that discretion with them as opposed to the select board if there's any need for the school department to run legal ads. I'll be honest with you, I strain to think of exactly what that would be, but I just wanted to make sure that in the, any event that that took place that the school department would, uh, the school committee would be the one setting the criteria for that rather than the select board out of respect for their jurisdiction. Um, so I, I think I've captured what, uh, and I appreciate Mr. Slotnick's patience on this, um, the intent of Mr. Slotnick and as well as the board sort of comments about what might make you more comfortable. Thank you, Mr. Heard. Um, thank you, Mr. Slotnick and Attorney Heim for your work on this. As Attorney Heim said, that I think the changes and the updates satisfy my concerns that I had. Uh, I'm happy to move for positive action with the changes as made. I'd say, Attorney Heim, with your A-list comments, you sound very towny there. <laughs> I strive to. Thank yes. you, sir. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> I will definitely second that. And Attorney Heim, answered my question because I saw you had the language in there for the school side. It's really straining in my head to try to figure. So thank you for, I'm like, I must be losing it. <laughs> I should know what legal notice is the schools do. Um, and I, I do want to thank um, Mr. Slotnick for bringing this to us because I think we'll probably be facing it much, much sooner rather than later. Um, and it's nice to have a process, Mr. Hurd's comments, the five options, which could always be added or, or amended to. Um, and I, I want to thank the town manager for discussing it with department heads so that I think that with the exception of a new department head coming on board, when she or he is faced with this situation, they already know that um, you don't have to resort to Global Herald. You know, check back in with the town manager pending the, the vote of town meeting. <clears throat> and I think that's a good conversation to have because I'd hate to have somebody do something that, you know, they get ten, forty thousand dollars into it, which can happen very quickly in, in press. Yeah. Mailings. <laughs> that money goes fast. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll second Mr. Star's motion. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm very happy to support this too, and that's an elegant solution, Mr. Heim. I mean, uh, the I mean, pick, pick two out of five. I like it. Uh, it's nicely, very nicely written. Yeah. Can we name that song? Two out of five ain't bad. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> and you're giving me the gavel for it. <laughs> so, so, anyways, yeah. So yes, yes. Uh, so on a uh, motion to move positive action by Mr. Hurd and second by Ms. Mahan. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. It is a hearing. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. If I you forgot. Want. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're revisiting. So thank you. Uh, so um, thank you both. You know, so uh, anyone want to comment on this? Uh, seeing no hands raised. Okay, okay. that's fine. Yeah. So so all right. Uh, so on motion to move out of the action, Mr. Hurd, and second by Mr. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. It's a three-zero vote with Mr. Helmuth recusing himself. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to see you. Thank you very much. It's getting lonely out here. <laughs> All right, so now we are on our final votes. Articles review, Article 9, 12, 13, 16, 19. 20, 63, 64, and 66. Yeah. Oh. We'll approval um, final votes and comments, if that's okay. Mr. Helmuth, I don't have to separate any of them. 
Okay, move approval from the votes and comments. Thank you. Thank you for asking. So, did you both say second at the same time? Nope. Okay, I'm just saying something. Okay, I'm just saying something. Good. Okay. All right. I, mean, I, I don't have anything to add. I'm fine. I don't have things. So, all right. So, that was just a nod. All right. Okay, so I'm motioned by um, Mr. Bahana, second by Mr. Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Hellman. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. <coughs> she, it's a 4 0 vote. Okay. Thank you. So, updates. Who's that by? So, shoot. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to risk over communicating on this you know, rather than, than last week. So, 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 um, so it's just. You know, just to make sure that we're all on the same page with the, with the components, the elements that I mean, we're thinking about writing into uh, the um, temporary adjustment of the policy. You know, so I just kind of wanted to list out all the things we discussed. You know, and um, I, I guess some. Um, if there are any comments on any of these, I mean that you want to give me as guidance as I try to um, re -re rewrite the. That part of policy, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do it. And I looked at it, and I, I think I'm going to end up just kind of putting in a, a section, you know, as opposed to rewriting and um, like redlining in the, the, the policy because it's just I just don't see figure out how to, I can't figure out how to do it, you know. So if someone has some insights into that, fine. Otherwise, I'll just maybe create a section saying hey, for from hey, from. June 1 through November 30th, this is what applies to me to overnight permanent parking. You know? uh, so uh, uh, one change from last time is that I want to bring the cap down from 300 to 200, I mean, uh, just to give us a little more headroom should things fill up fast. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, we do initially I mean, no, no um, restrictions, you know, uh, but then at November 30th, I mean, we pause and then based on what we see, you know, uh, whether to uh, have people come in to us, I mean, there's reasons that we have to um, uh, make a determination about. Um, um, one per household, one side of the street only, you know. I, uh, another little minor thing that we hadn't discussed, I mean, but I would like to um, limit the parking I mean, to the street on which they live. I mean, right now, the permanent parking stays like in front of your place. You know, and and I mean it's the same thing as, as the street, but I just kind of wanted to specify street, especially if we do get you know into the east, I mean, and we are limited to one household, but we could be three houses, I mean, in, or three cars I mean, in front of one, um, well, in front of one address, you know, uh, and and the other is to uh, in order to prevent having a street get clogged, I mean, it would additionally be limited I mean, to the amount of, the number of parking spaces on one side of the street. I mean, and, and as I told Ms. Meyer, I mean, if we see a street I mean, that gets maybe three or four requests, I, mean, I think it'll be just as easy as taking a satellite view I mean, um, from Google I mean, to get a sense of how many parking spaces are, are the, the cap there. Um, Failure to move a car I mean, will mean a loss of street overnight parking, but they will have the lot spot, you know. And and, um, and since the, our last meeting, I mean, we have confirmed I mean, that during snow emergencies, I mean, they can put their car uh, in a municipal lot, so they get a spot, get a spot in a, in a lot. I mean, and, and um, anything else here? Um, so yeah, we'll review the reasons for the permit request at the end of November. I mean, I think that's something we can put in place. I mean, um, um, if we decide to go forward like in annually, I mean, let's say we don't want to do the evaluation, you know, but at some point annually we can, you know, review, especially if we are finding ourselves um, at a cap. Uh, and, and then, of course, I, I said we, we pause in November, we you know, assess, you know, uh, and we can start the assessment before we pause, you know, uh, but then try to make a determination by January 1st, how we move forward. And, well, if we move forward, then how we move forward, if we do, do we increase the cap, I mean, do we continue with the auto approval, or do we have to come in and discuss things? So um, that's about it, you know. I, 
happen. So um, I guess Mr. Hart. Try not to have a 45-minute conversation. <laughs> uh, I'll go with whatever the board decides. I'm still with a pilot a little bit weary about having a strict cap because if, you, know, you want to kind of assess the data as it's going to be in, unless we're going to cap it in perpetuity. I, you know, what I'm trying to say is, you know, if all of a sudden in the first week you get 350 applicants and we only give 200 out, we know that there's a demand for 350 people. And if we want to assess the data and see how this will be, we should you know, do it. Practice like you play, um, but again, if the board thinks 200 is the number, that's fine. Um, oh, where it's one side of the street parking, are we going to set? Is it odd evens on odd years, odd side of the houses, just so that, that will be in the policy so people know? Um, I'd like to. I mean, I, I certainly understand the rationale and think it's good that people are held accountable. In the case of snow emergencies, I'd like to maybe build in, you know, one time you get a warning as in the event that, I mean, some, some people just don't know when this is. We had a snow emergency, I think, the other day, and we didn't have any snow, so somebody might not, might have the car out there not thinking that it's a snow emergency, so we would like to have at least one, you know, if someone gets pinged and says, listen, we notice that you didn't move the car in a snow emergency, just so you know the next time you do it, you're gonna lose your ability to park in the street. It's off of street cleaning too, you know, so. Yeah, well, whatever it's for. I mean, I just, it just strikes me that sometimes you need to just at least give somebody one, one reprimand. Um, but again, I'll go with the, the majority on the board on this. The one thing that I was thinking about the other day is where there's your neighbor complain. That's how currently our overnight parking is policed by neighbor complaints. Is there a mechanism where if someone calls the Arlington Police Department to report that a car is parked overnight, can the police department say to them, "Well, did you go first verify whether or not it had a sticker to try to prevent?" Where, where now we have cars in the street. And we might give out 200 permits, and then, you know, 500 people have cars parked on the street overnight. It's kind of onerous for the police department to be coming out and responding to all these calls when they validly parked cars. Am I saying that? Yeah, no, it no, is no, the point no, coming no, across. No. I'm just saying yeah. that all of a sudden we still have neighbors who are complaining about cars that are parked on the street and they're validly car parked cars our APD is going to have to respond to up to 200 cars that don't aren't in violation, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So I, I don't know how we do that or what the mechanism is, and that can sort of be flushed out in the enforcement. Right. But it's just something that I thought of that, I mean, could be a little bit of a debacle for APD, right. at least in the, in the first instance. <coughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 so. Yeah, and, and so I mean, you certainly can check with the chief and all that, and maybe you can kind of brought up a possible solution. It's like, hey, ask them did they go and. Well, that's what I'm saying. Can it be part of the yeah. thing that, that requires them to verify that? Right, right. Yeah. How, how you police that somebody actually went up and verified it? I don't know. Thank you. Um, this looks like a good list to me. Uh, one question I have, and not, not for an answer tonight, but just for you to chase down, um, is the enforceability of the loss of overnight street parking and the, the way that would work. Do they still have a sticker? Do we ask them to turn in their sticker? Do we ask them to go peel the sticker off? You know, I, I don't know. Yeah. So, that, so that's just a question. Yeah, no, I thought about that. Yeah. Because you know, they still get the lot spot. You know, right, exactly. Yeah. How do we do that? Right, right. Um, my biggest question is, what happens at the end of November is the intent that these permits would become invalid 
unless we extend the program. What are we going to tell people? Are we telling people that this may well be only good until November? Or are we say, are we issuing permanent permits, or at least an annual, an annual permit, the assumption that it would renew? Um, I think that we need, I would want to know what I'm voting on in that respect. And I don't you know whatever, whatever I propose, but just suggest that that be made explicit. Sorry, that was, that was another comment that I had. Um, ah. I think we should end it, review the data, and then determine how many permits we've gotten, have Chief Flaherty or Officer Rateau come in and give us an update from the APD's perspective <coughs> as to what their thoughts were, get some thoughts from, I, I don't think it should just yeah, I keep agree. going. and. We also, at that time, need to reassess how many permits we have, how we're, we're going to, I think in the, I mean, it's a pilot, and we let people know that this is a pilot, and just so you know, don't get used to it, buy another car, because we're giving you this permit, because this is going to end, and we're going to, we can't guarantee that it's going to go beyond the moment. Right. I would say, um, oh, Mr. Chairman. No, 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 no. Um, thank you, that's a good, good expansion of the point. I, I agree wholeheartedly on that. Um, and for that reason, I'm comfortable with a smaller cap as well. But you know, I don't. It's not a hill I want to die on. I would. Uh, one possibility could be that if if people do, I think it would be very wise not to buy another car, um, given this. But you know that we could. It, could we keep the town lot provision, even if we were to send to continue the, the, the overnight parking? And I don't know. And again, that kind of goes back to my first question: of, is that is that even enforceable, or how, what would the mechanism of that be? But. But I do like the idea of a real pause and a real evaluation. And I would suggest, we could decide this later, in addition to all the good ideas Mr. Hurd had, that we invite the public to contact us, perhaps um, inviting people on the streets that have permits, or just, you know, which would be a public forum, but, but just to do some really good listening as part of the data collection. Sorry, I was just doing math in my head. How many months is that? Yeah. So I just wanted to confirm. So for the pilot, we're going to charge people half of three. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I, I, I did June one because I don't I don't know if we have the time to pull it off by May. You know, so, sure so I mean I can have a conversation with folks if we decide to vote on it. And, and if it seems that we can pull it out in maybe five months, I mean, the alternative is push it back into December. Maybe. But I was thinking that we was do start doing some evaluation in November, even before it blows down. You know, uh, because as we know, we get to ask Thanksgiving. It's really hard to get much time. Uh -huh. I'm going to try to be brief. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever that movie is. Um, when we do vote, full board to vote, um, I just want to get back to how we originally went down this road, which was town meeting members for themselves or their constituency uh, speaking about because of a financial hardship in the place where they rented, the need for um, an expanded criteria that the select board has, or some sort of other process, which is what this pilot program is, is seeking information on. Um, so after November 1st, one of the things I'd be interested in is I'd like to, if I have the opportunity, um, refocus the board back that when we look at whatever the permits that were given out, if it's for a third, fourth, fifth car, which kind of flies in the face, I think, of why we went down this road. We didn't go down this road to say, we're gonna provide an opportunity. You already have two cars, you didn't get that third car because you had a fourth car or a fifth car because you had no way to park it. You know, I see those people participating in the pilot and I don't think, you know, let's just move forward. And go ahead. God bless you. Excuse but, me. Um, Thank you. I think, at the end of when we come to the assessment, we need to look at how many of those permits that were taken out were for the original intent and purpose. Um, taking away net zero and transportation issues and what we're, you know, asking people to think of how to be mobile in many different ways and not, but then, because um, I think of, there'll be a very s small number it say all 200 go out. I think there's going to be a lot of um, cut two, three, four, five. And to me, I would not vote at that. 
you know, should continue in the future, because that's not what this is, and I think it kind of flies in the face of some of the, the positions that we've taken, you know, moving forward, putting <coughs> climate change resiliency aside. Um, and then, you know, my thing would be on November 1st, um, where I'm sitting right now is I think we should, for the financial hardship issue only, expand our criteria for people who can come in and apply to the select board for these versus doing the honor system because I don't think, because I've spoken to a lot of people out there and, and I haven't gone into a, any discussion with them and it has nothing to do with an election coming up or anything like that, but um, of the people, I've only spoken to four actually who would avail themselves of the opportunity, but it's just get another car. It's not a financial hardship, and I think, and if I'm incorrect, but I think that's what started us down on this road, was right. to, to address that inequity issue. Yeah. I'd like to get back to that versus yeah. car three, four, five. Because yeah. I can tell you, my parents, we never owned a home. And <clears throat> we didn't own a car, because we couldn't afford the car, the insurance, or the gas, until I was in middle school. It was junior high east back then. And even then, you know, it, it, it was limited, so. Um, and that's the, that's the um, constituency I think that we, we were trying to address with that particular need. So um, I'll stop there. Well, that's part of the reason we're limited to 200 because I mean we're going to have to assess you know 200, and, and I think it's going to fall on our office to do that. <laughs> so, 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 so. Oh, Britain, <laughs> where are you? <laughs> so, so. Yeah. It's going to fall under us to issue the permits, just no, for clarification. No, no, to, to, assess, to assess the, 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 the reason for, for, <coughs> for taking the permit, you know, so, unless we can find another home for the work, you know, but. Well, I think that will be, I think we're going to, for the pilot, we're just going to have them issue the permits. It doesn't have to go to this board, right? Right. Right. But I think as part of the application, we have to make sure that they put a reason. Right, right, yes. But then I think it would be, uh, I think it would be our, on us to right. yeah. yes. review and assess that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I'll, I'll be working with whomever I mean, to design that form, you know, in terms of, of, of questions, you know, and, you know and, and I'll offer to work with the select board and staff regardless what happens. <laughs> on, on the first, you know, uh, so, uh, all right, all right, so I think we have a way forward, and so now I just need to figure out how to write this into, so, so uh, and I think my writing abilities will Good improve, luck. I mean, after, <laughs> after Thursday, I mean, you know, I have a little more free time, you know, so, okay, mm -hmm. well, thank you, thank you very much, folks, you know, so, uh, um, <coughs> and we'll see if I have it back, you know, on, on, um, I'm going to try and get it back on the 27th, you know. Uh, we'll have that interview and maybe just one other thing, you know, maybe a few other, a couple other items, but we'll, we'll focus on the main event, you know, that night, you know. So, um, all right, um, item number eight, you know, beautification committee, anything, Mr. Hurd? Yep. So we've been talking about the beautification committee for a little bit. So the beautification, I don't have the exact dates, but this was a committee that was created, I think, by Mr. Caro. I believe before I was on the board, the charge still has board of selectmen, so it dates itself a little bit. Um, we've had a lot of push in the past couple of years to get something going. I know the Chamber of Commerce has a beautification committee. This annual perennial disappointment in the Arlington holiday lights <laughs> in Arlington Center, so I think that's one of the things that the beautification committee can do. We, there's a certain amount of money in the DB, in the budget already for holiday lighting that I think the beautification committee essentially can come in and create the plan for to be implemented, and then it, it's more than holiday lights. But I think that that's one of the main thrusts that we're hearing from some a lot of residents in town as to in the chamber of commerce where we're trying to invite people to shop in arlington center particularly the heights in east arlington seem to do do a good job but in the center it, it struggles a little bit um 
So I do want to put a meeting of the beautification committee in play. And the reason I, that's why I've been on my phone, as I asked Ms. Maher to send me the charge, I didn't have it in front of me. I kept meaning to get this added to the, to the agenda. But I want to read out the members and then just see if any other members have any suggestions as to what could be added. And I think the members that you see here, it, it was a, sort of a specific purpose of the beautification committee back then that might not jive with what we're looking to do with it now. But currently is one member of the Board of Selectmen, change that to select board, or designee, one member of the Veterans Council, um, one designee of the Arlington Garden Club, one designee from the Chamber of Commerce, then the Economic Development Coordinator, member from DPW, then three residents. Um, I think since then, you know, I know we have the Arlington Center Merchants Association. Uh, I think the, the Heights has a Mer Merchants Association that I think could benefit from a representative. I was actually thinking more, more than one from the Chamber of Commerce, but I think if you have those mer Merchants Associations from the Center, the Heights, I don't recall if there's still a Capitol Square yeah, I don't it's know if they're still around either. Association, I think, I think, but... I, I, think, I think they may have gone to five. I mean, we also have the three residents, but, I mean, that was my... And I guess it, it doesn't hurt having it in there. I don't know if, based on what the Beautification Committee is really trying to do right now, if, you know, the Veterans Council or the Garden Club still makes sense. If it does, that's fine. Um, I don't know what the original intent of having the garden club's role, other than I know. I get that the garden club can kind of go hand in hand with with flower for floral arrangements and whatnot, but I don't know. I guess I'm bringing this to the board for discussion with a little guidance, but hoping for to see if anyone has any comments as to what other suggested designees that could be on the beautification committee as we start to put this together or just those additions of the at least the Arlington Center and the Heights Merchants Association with the current membership makes sense or um, open to any ideas I guess. Just a question is this, this is a, a committee of the select board I assume? Yeah so this was created the charge says there is hereby establish an outdoor beautification committee of the Board of Selectmen, which purposes shall be to develop a program of appropriate seasonal and patriotic displays, installations, and decorations in Arlington's public spaces, primarily concentrated along the main public ways in town. Which I think that charge is fine. I think that's what we're trying to accomplish with it. Um, I think. I guess my rationale for some of the merchants associations is that the, a lot of the voices I hear are from either the Chamber of Commerce or business, the business sector that says, you know, we really would like to see the town step up their game as far as decorations and in, I think the reason we say holiday decorations is that, you know, that's the, the shopping season and trying to attract people to shop local and to come here instead of Bel uh, Belmont or Lexington or our neighboring communities. Uh, so I think yeah, to the extent we could get as many local business voices on this type of committee, it will help out because that's really who's benefiting from it. And it doesn't have any actual appointees now, right? This is all Is it, We haven't populated it. It was created gotcha. by the then Board of Selectmen um, at a time uncertain. <laughs> but I know Joe Curl was on the board. And the, uh, I, I don't think it, we ever actually got kicked it into motion. Which I do want to do is actually start, is populate the board and get appointees. Support. Just a couple of things I'd like to mention that may be relevant to this conversation. One is that the uh, Parking Benefits District budget includes $136,499 in various improvements to the uh, 
parking benefits district in the town center. Uh, there are seasonal plantings. There is watering for seasonal plants. Seasonal decorations, which will enhance the money that's already in the DPW budget. Uh, some money for trash management. Um, a little bit of improvements to the visitor center and some wayfinding signs. So um, I've had some conversations both with the Parking Benefits District Committee and with members of the Chamber of Commerce uh, and Julia Myrek Keith. Um, we have money there for, you know, a, a fairly good sum, I'd say, for focusing on that area. The other thing that we've put forward, although we need some further clarification as to what it's going to do, is we've made a recommendation to the Finance Committee that we put in $25,000 in the FY24 budget for the 250th anniversary, which um, it's not exactly beautification, but it will go toward generally signage or various other things that we might do around the 250th anniversary. Um, I mention that both because I think it's relevant to the idea of spending and beautification, but also because um, I need some guidance as to how we might spend that money. Um, we just kind of came up with a figure, but uh, the Finance Committee is now asking me, all right, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> uh, so to the extent that uh, any members of the board could provide that guidance or help to me uh, at some point, that would be useful in getting it past the Finance Committee. I just want to mention those things. I saw that email. I didn't respond because I thought <laughs> you knew where I was going to point you to. Mr. Hart. Um, I'll take the last point first. Sure. And I think yeah, we, the 2025 committee is meeting every two weeks right now. So it might be helpful. I don't know if the timing lines up. I think our next meeting, it's in the next couple of weeks. It, it might be less this board and more to come into that meeting and have a discussion. Or if it needs to be done quicker, I can talk to members of the board. But there are, that committee is gonna explode with subcommittees and this, that and the other, and grant writing committees. And, and I think we'll be able to identify pretty quickly what that can be spent on. Um, but I just, if the timing, if, if it can wait till the next 2025 committee, and I'll get you the exact date then. You could come into the meeting, and I think they could explain to you, give it a pretty easy explanation as to how that how far that money can go. Um, then, as far as funding, I mean, we had had discussions, and I think I had bespoke maybe when speaking to people at the Chamber of Commerce of the idea of this beautification committee having its own budget because some committees have like ATEN has a annual budget, and we just spend get to spend that money. Whereas, at least in the near future, there's money to be, like I said, on the DPW already put, puts into holiday lighting in the center, and we have other sources of revenue or funds that we can use for certain aspects that the beautification committee can come up with. I think in its first inception, it's more of a design committee where the beautification committee, if there's a member of DPW that's on the beautification committee, we say, all right, you know, ahead of the holiday lighting season, we say, we come up with a plan and we talk to the DPW member and say, this is what we'd like to to put, put in for our holiday lighting. And he goes back to, you know, whether it's Mike Rademacher or someone that works under Mike Rademacher goes up to Mike, or however it works, says, all right, is this in the budget to implement this plan? And that way, there's voices that aren't just the DPW workers, and, and nothing against DPW workers. They they do a fine job, but they're not necessarily lighting designers. And I think where the the, the committee can come together is come up with plans, and this is what we'd like to see. And like at the when we took up at the parking advisory committee, we took up the parking. Uh, benefits expenditures and Julie Myra came in with the wish list from the uh, Chamber of Commerce and we she listed a number of things that 
the Chamber of Commerce would like to see the funds spent on, and a lot of them we're going to take care of. So I think it's just another area, another community that's just centralized on these are the things that we need to do to make <clears> our <throat> our business areas look better, and we'll work with the town via the designees to get a path to implement those. And I say, that, and you know, we'll I'll follow up with some of the members of the Chamber of Commerce that I talked to initially, where. Again, I think I misspoke as as to having specific funds that the committee is just going to write checks to to buy. But I I don't think it's going to hinder what the beautification committee is trying to accomplish because there is fund like the manager says there's funds to to pay for the expenses. It's just not a separate bank account that the beautification committee maintains. And I'll explain that to them. But I, part of the reason I want to put this on the agenda is just to, for my own sake, to kickstart me to, I mean, set set a meeting and get people to populate the board. So, so right now, I mean, the money that is spent that I mean, is used for lighting, who makes the decisions about how the lighting is is done? Like, who makes to the extent there's a beautification decision to be made you know, with the monies that are spent, who's, who are making those decisions? Probably Mike Rodmacher, um, because the money, there's a mu certain amount that he has in his budget yeah. that he can go contract out to a company <coughs> to uh, come in and if you give them X number of dollars, they'll put up Y amount of lights. Right. Um, with the enhanced money from the Parking Benefits District, he can then go out and buy more lights, and there'll be some conversation about, all right, they're on these trees, now put them on those trees too, or? All right, all right. just trying to make sure that we weren't gonna have the, some other group of people who are making these decisions that this group would either have to work with or, or, or so, okay, so. I, I, Yeah, I would say if there's a beautification committee that wanted to give input into that, right. I mean, ultimately, if we're putting things on town property, it's a town department has to make an ultimate decision about what that, where that goes. Right. But always having the input from the merchants or residents right. or businesses along that area would be useful. So then on that committee, is, some, is there someone? There's a member of DPW on this okay, committee. Right, fine, that's fine. I mean, I think I would like to get to a point where DPW was working with and you know, respecting the designs that come, are, right, right, right. come up from. So, so the source of funds. Not in all, no. sorry, no, 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 sorry. No, no, no. not in every season, but certainly in, right. in some seasons. And to the extent we can get away from wrapping the tree trunks, which drives me bananas every year when I see it, that, that would, that's a major step forward. Yeah, I got you. you know. Okay, so the source of funds that they are directing is coming from the parking benefits district. Yeah, okay, fine, fine. And, 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 and the DPW budget. And DPW, okay, all right. And so they'll, they'll know that, you know, they'll know that there are no more, more other funds, you know, and so, okay, fine, fine, you know, so um, so I don't have um, any, any, the three, the, what's, what would be the process for how the three residents were chosen? I mean, I think you guys can vote to make me the designee or not. But I think like in most committees it's this resident designees, whoever is the select board to designee will handle anybody that's in any interest and talk to them and then just make a recommendation to the board. Um, I, so I get it, I guess I don't want to take any members off the committee because, I mean, I understand why the Veterans Council is there and the Garden Council, and if it's still in the wisdom of the board to leave them on there. I guess I would just make a motion to amend the charge just to add one member of the Arlington Center um, Business Association, one member of the Arlington Heights Business Association, in addition to the one member of the Chamber of Commerce, and just leave it at that. To second that and suggest an amendment that we also designate Mr. Hurd as the select board member. 
If Mr. Hurd will accept that, then we'll make it to this motion. I'll accept. I'm sorry, I've been looking over here. You've been okay. no, all right. Sorry. If I'm not, you can just I'm Alan, it's got my back. If I right. do this, that's right. <laughs> Okay, so although Mr. Helmuth is the resident gardener, um, this is well, this is, this and he's is true. also the grainer or the miller. Well, yes, yeah, it's, it's really more vegetables than it is yeah. Yeah, beauty, so you know, <laughs> talk to me when we have a town farm and I'll be all over it. Okay, I mean, so on uh, a motion, I mean, to um, approve the new um, makeup of the um, beautification committee with. Mr. Hurd as the select board designated by Mr. Helmuth and a second by Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hahn. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mr. Hahn? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Four zero. Great. So, um, on to the proposed updates to the select board handbook. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Uh, the members have had circulated to them a red line copy and an updated red line that I sent out individually this weekend um, for review but not discussion. That is uh, the newest red line is now, thank you to Ms. Marr, has been, now been posted on Nova's agenda for the, for the public. Um, my suggestion would be, well I guess the question and suggestion is if my colleagues have had time to review that, I'd suggest that we do this discussion once when we're going to vote. Um, and so if anybody's not had a chance to review that, um, you know, we, we, we could consider whether or not we want to discuss it without a vote. Um, I will say that although we have the absence of Mr. DeCourcy, um, he was, as our chair likes to say, my plus one on this, and, uh, and I have incorporated his suggestions, and he's said to me he would be fine if we did proceed. Um, I have one suggested change, and it's just an oversight on my part, an editing change, and that is on page 21 in the open forum. Um, oh, that's exactly area. what I have in front of me. Yeah, <laughs> um, and I should say th uh, thanks to Attorney Heim for making some suggestions that um, I have uh, included, incorporated, that are, in his opinion and advice, in conformity with the Supreme Judicial Court's recent ruling. Um, and I think those are pretty self-evident in the red line. The, uh, there's probably more than one correction that I didn't, I didn't miss, but the one that I didn't miss is that current, the, the revised item six on page 21 of the document, so numbered, is um, 6C is now redundant. I just forgot to strike that because it got moved up to the top of number six. So this, the phrase refrain from any conduct, which substantially disrupts, et cetera, um, just got moved up to the head of, of, of item six, all speakers. So that is, I would suggest if we were to vote, um, for just editing that we would strike that so that it doesn't appear twice. And, uh, so. uh -huh. um, in light of the discussion with your plus one, Mr. DeCourcy, um, I'd like to, if we could, first have a vote on this tonight in, in, the, in the work that um, Mr. Helmuth has put into it. So first I'd like to and then I have something I'd like to put on the table, maybe for a discussion when we have the full board, or maybe when we have our goals meeting, typically in the summertime. So my motion would be to uh, receive and approve the proposed updates to the select board handbook. And then, um, it's funny you said, honest to goodness, at page 21 here, which triggered um, something with me. And then I just had a real quick question um, which might fall to Attorney Heim on page 27 under licenses and permits. But when I was looking at the red line changes on page 21 um, that Mr. Helmut just referenced, it sort of reminded me, um, and I think we should either, after April 1st, um, the next chair at a regular scheduled board meeting or the next chair's discretion at a select board goals meeting uh, in terms of what's missing from the select board handbook because when I was reading this on page 21 it sort of not so it triggered with me and I don't know if it's something that should be in the select board handbook should be codified or should not or should be codified in a different way and I think it's something that's very very valuable in using what you highlighted on page 21 that Mr. Helmet and attorney I made sure it's in concord with current state law um, there's sort of been an unspoken tradition that 
um, the outgoing chair usually within two to four weeks has an informal cup of coffee with the, the incoming chair and offers whatever, you know, this worked for me, this didn't work for me. But one of the things I was thinking is, is that something that, that practice should be codified? I think really very strongly that, um, um, like, I know that two, two time, three times that I've been the outgoing chair, I've highlighted like four or five points. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've always said, your chair, um, she or he, because there was, t um, it's, it's your discretion, but like especially here on, uh, in, in order to keep the best record we can, I think one of, the, I know one of the things I always say, um, even if the person knows it, but sometimes, you know, the person, sometimes I've had incoming chairs saying, you know, I was wondering why you did that, and or, oh, I didn't even notice you asked that, like name and record, name and address for the record, sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this is conversation, um, regardless of what comes up, that the, the next chair I'll pass on to him or her, him, excuse me, not her, I'll pass on to him um, about how he might want to handle that. So it would be, you know, what's missing from the handbook and when should it be discussed? Regular select board meeting, goals and, uh, goals and objective, mission in July. And then I just had a real quick question, if I could, Mr. Chair, sure. and then I promise this will be it. That's fine. Um, I'm just curious, on page 27, when it talks about licenses and permits, am I correct that, um, first tell me if it's a term I shouldn't be using anymore, but, but when we recently had discussions about busking and busking permits, does that fall under street performance, special event permit? Do we still call it busking, or is that a no? We call it street performance license. Street performance, okay. So that is included in there, because yes. I can see the gentleman who advocated it right here before me. That's it, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair? Yes, just, just a quick response of, of appreciation to Ms. Mahana. Having just gone through this experience of revising this, uh, which hadn't had a substantial revision in a few years, I, I have a fresh appreciation for the value of, co of the passing of wisdom and continuity, and I think you spoke really eloquently to that, Mrs. Mahad, um, and I, as the keeper of a lot of that continuity, frankly, and I, I appreciate that. Um, so I, I like the idea of considering, um, not tonight just for efficiency, but, but the next time that we um, talk about this, whether that might be a select board goal, to just to think of this as more of a living document because it is, it's useful to the board, to new members of the board, it's useful to the public to set expectations um, and, um, you know, having, having something there about introducing a, a handoff tradition and other, you know, other kind of re review, exit interviews, whatever that is, might, might actually be a really nice thing to consider adding to this. Can mm. we make it that the outgoing chair has to treat? I think that's a really that's a story for another idea. day. <laughs> Buy a coffee or a beer for the incoming chair. Yeah. Our going chair just gets to pick the place business establishment, so they should pay for it. <laughs> but anyways, thank you. I guess my only issue, you know, with open forum um, um, adjustments I mean, is that see most of this is about I me mean, what the board does. You know, and, and here we're talking about what residents do, and it doesn't really tell us what to do should open forum go south. You know, uh, and, and so, 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 like, how do how do we handle you know if someone is being intentionally disruptive? I don't really have a problem with people uh, being offensive. I mean, it's like go at have at it, you know, and and, and, and or even uncivil, you know. But I mean, disruption is a, a, another kettle of fish. If we can't conduct our business, I mean, then 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 we're there's a problem. I mean, and so either I me mean, that is the point, I me mean, to disrupt. And so then, how do we handle that? I me mean, or it's not the point. I mean, the person doesn't really see themselves as being disruptive. Like if someone comes in and protests, I me mean, the point is to, is to disrupt. I mean, if they're just being obnoxious, you know, and continually so disruptive, I mean, then how do we handle it? So you want to answer, go ahead. Huh? I do, thank you, I, I thought about this. Uh, I'm, 
my understanding is that state law uh, provides for that, that the chairman of, of, a, of a meeting of any public body, body has, um, has the authority to uh, enforce what is permissible to enforce in state law. That includes disruptive behavior, disruption by the speakers that substantially impair the, 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 uh, the conduct of the meeting. Um, the reason that it doesn't have a lot more detail is I didn't want to overemphasize the point. We don't really have a lot of problems, and I like, and I think that's good. And and I think you know, there's a tone question here about um, suggesting that it's the free a free for all that it's just not. But given that there is a provision in state law that the chair, if necessary, can even you know summon the authority, so things get really out of hand um, within the bounds of the new guidance from the Supreme Judicial Court. But that's that's the rationale for right. for focusing on expect, general expectations of conduct, um, conduct without necessarily going into ex, explicit definitions that are contained in state law. And I would invite Attorney Heim to uh, correct me or expand upon that if necessary. Yes, yes, sure. yes sir, Heim. I don't want to take up too much time on this, but that's correct. I think one of the things that was a little uns unsatisfying about the court's decision is there's a sort of qualifier at the end that says, of course, fighting words are not allowed. But what fighting words constitute in um, a town form of government where there's a lot of access and there's sometimes a relationship between the person who's speaking and the volunteers and elected and things like that can be a little bit complicated. If somebody says something that's anti-Semitic, homophobic, something like that, makes a charge that someone's a Nazi who lost their family in the Holocaust, is that a fighting word? So there's some unsatisfying things about yeah. it, but the, 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 the real core of it is that um, we know that you can't disrupt the meeting or uh, make it impossible for the board to conduct its business. And so when someone is engaged in a protest, as you're suggesting, that's kind of a different lens. Right. This is more about like resetting the fact that people are allowed to be rude and uncivil, unfortunately, um, and that you know if someone has something like that to say, even if it's borderline sort of scandalous or inappropriate and stuff like that, as long as they're not threatening someone or cursing you know, them out or something like that. Um, we're going to basically allow them to, to speak. If it becomes disruptive, the board, has, the chair of the board has the ability to suspend, uh, to go into recess, which is actually one of the things in the facts of the case. Mm -hmm. The chair also has the ability to bang a gavel and say, you know, order, order, you know, I'd ask you to, you know, be quiet, your time is up. You're not recognized to speak, things like that. I think one of the things that my office is contemplating doing is doing a training specifically for chairs of boards and bodies to help folks get a little bit more comfortable with their role. Sometimes the most effective thing to do in those situations, if you can just editorial for just one more minute, no, please, please. Is, is to actually address what's being said, which is, you know, you're engaging, say, a theoretical resolution, you're engaging in some hyperbole where you're accusing me of, of misconduct or being on the take or something like that. Is that what you're saying? You're saying that I'm actually taking some sort of bribe? Because if you are saying that, you should state it for the record. And if you're not saying that, you're trying to gain leverage or add to your argument by saying something that you know isn't true. So that's something that a lot of volunteers in particular aren't as comfortable with as elected officials who are oftentimes a little bit more used to the verbal sparring that happens in, in, a, in a, a body. So my, my, my concern is less about this board and your policy in that circumstance. You also have the support of the manager, the council, um, your administrators. So there's a lot of, of, of folks here. So I, I would carry with Mr. Helmuth's recommendation that I wouldn't put any more detail into this. Because it's a nuanced area, um, there's nothing wrong with the chair of a board just trying to hit pause and asking people you know, for some quiet for a moment so that they can recognize the next speaker or they can decide what to do. But I, I think trying to over um, legislate in your handbook would probably cause more harm than good. All right, so because so, I my thoughts mean if I got this situation like that, I would be happy. We will we'll go over and go over oh, in some way. The, if if I were anticipating it, then I would have a conversation with you beforehand. It's like, what do I do in a situation like this? You know, and so so um, and because I, I was one of the people you know that did read the handbook you know um, when I was campaigning the first time. So. So, and, and I, I can't say that that really was a burning issue, you know, um, for me, because there was a pandemic, and it was kind of took a priority over everything at that time, you know, so, okay, all right, I'm fine, yes, yes, please. Um, and again, when we have the, when the board has the future discussion, um, 
in conversations that I've had with town council and with other council in my day job, job especially when this ruling came out, which basically said my interpretation of what has been told to me, um, people can be rude and uncivil um, because it could be subjected open to interpretation. But um, what, what, and you can't regulate that, but what you can regulate is someone get up, be rude, uncivil, say it, but then once they become repetitive, it's a disruption. So you're not making a judgment call on what they're saying or saying whether they can say that, barring the examples that town council gave in the beginning. But, um, and that's where, because I was really frustrated to say, I would like to think there's some sense of decorum, civility, you know, I certainly would abide by it. And I, I would just say for myself, moving forward, um, most people that I've encountered over the years that for whatever reason, and there is a reason, and sometimes the reason is no reason, but usually there's a reason behind it. Um, I, I found for myself in, in moving forward when you're talking to chairs and other chairs is um, for whatever reason that a, a, a resident, a person, someone appearing at a microphone at any board or commission meeting, if kind of like let them have their, their say, because we have to under the law, and say it, um, I found, you know, not responding to it because eight times out of ten that person, that's what they want. I have a relative no matter what that just loves, and I love this person dearly, but they just love to argue and should say to me, oh, that's a really nice maroon jacket you have on. And I've learned to say, I didn't even notice it. You're right, it is. Because so, um, I know a lot, of, you know, a lot of times it's just sometimes for whatever is behind it. Some people just want to be like that. Kind of like let them be and then say, okay, you've made that point twice. You're disruptive now, move on. Because um, you kind of can't win, you know. But anyway, so um, I'll leave it there. I don't know if anyone seconded my motion. So, can I... Second? <laughs> Thank you. So, Sorry. Any other Sorry. questions? Comments? Thank you all for your consideration. Yeah. Yeah, thank well, you for thank joining us. Yeah, thanks for doing it. You know, so, uh, Wait, so. was that Mr. Greeley? <laughs> I'm, I'm the person who created this, so no one's thanking me. Thank you, Mr. Greeley. Thank you, Mr. Greeley. It was, it was I, I will say, it was when I was considering running for board, I read it as well. When I was elected, I read it as well. And, it, and even though it was a little out of date, it was extremely helpful. Yeah. So it's a, a privilege to be able to update it. So on. So, um, on a motion to approve the newly edited version of the select board's handbook, you know, by Ms. Mahan and second by Mr. Hurd. Ms. Mahan. Mr. Hurd would say, thank you for choosing Arlington. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hurd. I was going to make a comment that I think Mr. Greeley handed that, this to me roughly five oh, years ago. But I think it's been in my drawer since. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Greeley, I, I read the whole thing. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Greeley, I've done my best, but uh, <laughs> you, 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 the credit is all to you, sir. Yes. Here's, here's how many I <laughs> And after we take this vote, when uh, you have time, because you don't have any other time, if uh, the current copy with the revisions and select board handbook, uh, if oh, these yeah. could be taken out and the other one. The, the practice was, if you want to continue on, there's one in every drawer. Um, well, there should be. Well, maybe there should be. But at least get these ones out of here. Yeah. Yeah. The good Kevin story. First, maybe take a picture of it. She has it too. You went and got all these banners made. He and the town businesses donated. And I got a call from DPW guy saying, "You guys ever read these things? Is this is this for real?" And so I went down and I told them, "Just hang one. Don't." Go crazy, because within the hour you're going to get a call. And Mr. Grayley had meant to make up Board of Selectmen banners, mm -hmm. and he did broad selectmen. <laughs> and there were three women on the board at the time. We had it hanging in our office yeah, for so. some time. So yeah, if these could, after, ton after nice. tonight, someone recycle these. And yes. um, 
you know, maybe not put new ones in there. I don't want to make, but each member of the board is supposed to have a handbook. So once it's updated, we'll do that. Thank you. Yes, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Mask on, you can't see how many times I've yawned in the last <laughs> five minutes. I've fallen off a cliff again. <laughs> so, unfortunately, yeah, another problem. I did, I did pretty well tonight, but fortunately, fortunately, unlike me last time, we only have like you know the, the letters to go. So, um, correspondence received. Who received? Second. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we maybe want to, I think we want to direct, you know. Number 11. I'll take up 11 with um, the town manager. You know. So. Okay, great. So, so uh, motion to receive by Mrs. Mahan and a second by Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Hines. Yes. Yep. Yes. 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 And so, um, so um, I guess um, new business, Ms. Meyer. No new business. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Hines. No new business. Mr. Fuller. I'd just like to give credit to Mr. Heim for uh, sending out notices to all of the different committees who need to appoint members of the Police okay. Review Committee. So that starts the 90-day clock for them to get back to us. We've already heard back from some of them, uh, but I just wanted you to know that that process is now moving forward. Okay, great. Mr. Mr. Hurd? This is a silly little thing that I just thought of, but when can we transition back to voice votes? It's not like yeah. a big deal, but it's like, I mean, I know we did that because of the hybrid, but I mean, before people would watch us on TV. So. That's a wonderful point, Mr. Jerry. Correct. As long as all members are in attendance, you can take your votes in your normal way. It's going to be weird, but yeah, you can go we, back. We can the, save at least, you know, 46 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> So we so, talk about overnight parking and beautification. No. So, so you're saying? I thought I thought because it was hybrid, we had to. That's what I thought. It, it's your participation that matters. So oh. It's it's not the members of the of the. Well, I I'll have to think. I'm sorry, Mr. I'll have to think about this because to the extent that people are just viewing it and might be submitting comments, I don't think that that would be constitute a hybrid under the law. To the extent that you're having hearings where like applicants are appearing before you. You might have to make sure. I have to look at that a little bit carefully because I think it's. It, I mean, the intent of the law is primarily so people can understand and follow what's going on. But for the select board, it's televised. Everyone can kind of see your vote. None of you are appearing by remotely right now. So um, it may be that we don't need to do it anymore. I'll, I'll double check that. And can yeah, you look I mean, at, yeah. I obviously did it because of Zoom. Yeah. But before the old. <laughs> a whole hybrid participation. If someone wanted to watch a meeting, they'd watch on TV, and it's the same situation as if they're watching. I, th I thought it was, if I may, Mr. Chair, if you could correct me that I'm wrong, but I thought it was if a full board is here, we can do all in favor, all opposed. If anyone, some, or all of us are not here and we're taking advantage of the hybrid format and we're on the screen, then we have to do it that way. So if you could find out if yeah. that's right or wrong. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Sorry, Thank Mr. Turner. All right. Mr. Hollis? No new business. Thank you. Only two. I haven't had any in, in a while. The first one is, <clears throat> if the, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the town manager, if either the, we can know the short answer tonight or in the future, just because people are starting to ask me, um, about the suspension of collecting for the parking meters here on um, Mass Ave, uh, which the town manager and town treasurer, when it was brought to their attention, evaluated it and said um, they were suspending it till uh, at least, I believe, the end of March. And a big re part of the reason was because didn't have the new meters to put in and other things that need to be done. So people are asking me, is that March 31st date still set and everything's ready to go April 1st, or is that going to be extended out if I could? Yes. Um, as far as I know, it's still on schedule. Uh, the meter should be going in soon. Uh, when I meet with the acting treasurer tomorrow, I will ask him about the progress, but I've not been told that we have any delays. Okay, so 
if people ask me starting April 1st, they better put, stop putting quarters or do the pay feature? Or are you going to let us know that? Well, yeah, I mean, there will be okay. new meters up there, so people will notice that. Okay, so when they see new meters, you better stop. Okay. Yeah. That's what they're asking. Yeah. And then the second one, and it, it in, in no way means any sarcasm, so I'll just try to make it as brief as possible. And I don't expect the town manager to know this. If you do, God bless you. But um, um, it, all, all of us know IAFF, International Association of Firefighters, Ed Kelly, Rich McKinnon, da 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 da. I know that um, today, because in a different conversation with one of the people I just mentioned, um, they spoke about, and this is not meant sarcastically, it's sincere, um, that the IAFF is um, filing against the, like the National Fire Safety Prevention Board that, um, and I think it's um, under uh, their regulation 1971, because I remember 1971, that the National Safety Fire Protection Standards which govern the equipment that um, Rich McKinnon sent it to me. Govern, oh please, uh, the bunker equipment for firefighters. The way 1971 is written that um, it requires the use of PFAS's, PFAS and firefighter protective gear. And as we know, and I'm not being sarcastic, it's cancer-causing agent in the IAFFF has, and my brother-in-law is one of them who's, he's on the video and unfortunately has a terminal illness. So that relates to me since um, Ed Kelly and um, President Kelly and President McKinnon put this out. I'm just wondering if, if you could find out through Chief Kelly if any of our firefighter, um, it's their protective gear. It says their bunker pr protective gear. If we could just double check, I know that Chief Kelly and Chief Jefferson before him, when the fire stations were done over, they got special hazardous um, hazmat suit, washing machine and dryer, I don't mean to say it like that. Um, I don't think this is anything we have to be concerned about, but I guess because it's a, um, what did he say it was, NFPA. National, National Fire Protection Association. That's who the IAFF is suing. That's who they're saying this protective equipment, it's mandated and PFAS is in there. If we can just double check that we don't have that in there. Sure. So, uh, so we uh, won't uh, be joining the suit. And if we do, then I'll just leave it to the town manager and Chief Kelly. On it. And I'm, I don't, I'm not saying that. It's, it's just so happened I got it today. It's not. Um, and that's it for new business. Thank you. Yeah, so I think the only thing is I may um, ask um, our um, board event to I'll check to see I mean, whether Tuesday or Wednesday would be better for that backup, uh, that second meeting next week if it's needed. Can we just, if we need another meeting, kick it to another meeting? Because again, we're not in a rush. So kick it to the third? Yeah. We'll be two. If we need more time, we'll just go over what? what was that for? I'm sorry. Uh, it would be for me once we do the town manager interview if we need more time to make a decision whether we would do it the you know, uh, 27th or the 3rd or 27th and the 3rd. Or, or would we do another meeting next week? So you're saying that do not schedule another meeting next week? I mean, I still think that we have a major time crunch. So with that, Keep, I mean, everyone's going to come in when we have a meeting, so the, the more, I mean, that's well, and whatnot, so I would say well, let's... There is the possibility that the board will be different on the 3rd versus what it is on the 27th? Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that, but I mean, when we come in, town staff and ACMI has to get you, get it done. Yeah. So if we add another meeting versus just having it during our normal, right. normally scheduled meetings, then... Yeah. It saves a lot of. Yeah, yeah I, th I think that's that's a really good point given our hybrid requirements and ACMI and everything. That, um, but I think maybe a remedy for the potential uh, change in the board would be to, uh, if we find ourselves in another circumstance, we, we could decide to take the final vote after the election. Okay. Okay. All right. Then we want to schedule the meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. All right. So um, easy enough. And so. 
On that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. And so, motion to adjourn by Ms. Mahan and second by Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Yes. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Did you get Mr. Wade? Say that? Say it? Did you get Mr. Wade?